yield back my time. Thank you. Without objection, any prepared statements that our witnesses may have will be included in the record. I'd like to welcome our first panel, Chairman Jim Jordan and Ranking Member Gerald Nadler uh, from the Committee on the Judiciary, Chairman Mike Turner and Ranking Member James Himes from the in Committee on Intelligence. Uh, Chairman Jordan, I would welcome your opening testimony. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member. Good to be with you. A uh, year ago, 11 months ago, uh, the Washington Post reported that the FBI misused the 702 a database and surveillance program, the surveillance tool, misused it 278,000 times. 278,000 times they didn't follow the law and the rules that were already in place. The base text, the way this is going to work, um, the base text, the way this is going to work is there's some reforms in the base text um, that, uh, well, the way it's going to work is how you guys determine the way it's going to work when you pass a rule or if, if you pass the rule. Uh, but the base text has some reforms that I think make sense, but I think the fundamental question still is if the FBI that wouldn't follow the procedures in place and 278,000 times didn't follow those procedures, are new requirements, whether it's in the traditional FISA or in the 702 program, going to be enough to safeguard Americans' liberties? So for me, I'm just going to cut to what I think is the most important. We were here two months ago. Ranking Member Nader and I had a robust discussion with this committee been a couple hours here talking about the various amendments and the, and the base bill. But the thing that I think counts the most is the warrant requirement amendment. That was in the base text of the bill that came out of our committee. Came out of our committee, by the way, 35 to 2, strong by part, the strongest we've probably ever had in that committee, certainly in this Congress. Um, the warrant requirement, I think, is what's needed because when you have the history we have with this organization relative to not following the rules, we think you need a separate and equal branch of the government to look at, uh, to approve a warrant before you can query American citizens' information. And that, to me, is the most important thing. Um, we have exceptions built into our warrant requirement. If there's a, an imminent threat of data, that's an exception. If you agree to let the FBI, if you talk to them and say, yeah, you can, you can use my phone number, our email address to search, you agree to that. Or if there's a known cyber threat, some malware you know about, that's an exception too. But if you're going to look in this, what I call the haystack of information that is collected, which has Americans' information in it, if you're going to use Jerry Nadler's phone number or his email address, then you should go to a separate and equal branch of government to get a warrant to do so. That is how our system works. We think that is the fundamental thing. And frankly, I appreciate what we've got in the bill and, and, and the base text, and those reforms are, I think, positive. But without the warrant, I don't think we've done our job. I don't think we've protected Americans in the way that we should. So for me, that's the key element. I know Chairman, uh, Ranking Member Nader will go through more of the legislation. I'm happy to answer questions. But that is what I think is the most important. Finally, well, let me say one other thing. I do think that the other amendments that I understand are being talked about, offered from the Intel Committee, and I appreciate the work that these guys do, but offered from the Intel Committee, those amendments actually expand FISA. And I thought what we were trying to do is reform it and protect Americans' liberty. So for me, the fundamental issue is the warrant requirement. That has to be in the legislation, or I don't think we've done our job. And with that, I would yield back to the chair. Thank you for your testimony. We now turn uh, to our good friend, Ranking Member Nadler, for any opening statement he cares to make. Well, thank you, uh, Chairman Cole, Ranking Member McGovern. Thank you for inviting me to testify before you once again on the important topic of surveillance reform. As I've stated repeatedly throughout this process, it is long past time for Congress to rein in abuse of FISA Section 702 authorities by the intelligence community. Yes, there are already laws on the books designed to protect Americans from unauthorized government surveillance. But we know from our oversight efforts and the intelligence community's own reporting that these laws are often disregarded and are at the very least inadequate to keep this powerful surveillance tool in check. For example, under current law, intelligence officials must find it reasonably likely that a U.S. person query of the 702 database will turn up evidence of a crime or foreign intelligence information. But this is of little comfort if the FBI repeatedly and flagrantly ignores this and other rules designed to prevent government overreach, which we know to be the case. That is why a probable cause requirement, with reasonable exceptions, should be required to search for U.S. person information, such as an American's name or a U.S.-based phone number. Without such reform, I cannot support reauthorization of these authorities. The Judiciary Committee is tasked with reauthorizing Section 702, which sunsets next week. For over a year, 
we have worked on a bipartisan basis to study the problem of intelligence committee agencies' abuse of FISA powers and to analyze solutions for preventing government overreach while keeping Americans safe from those who would do us harm. We held multiple hearings and overwhelmingly passed bipartisan legislation to reauthorize Section 702 last December. Mr. Biggs' bill, which was co-sponsored by Chairman Jordan, myself, and many others across the ideological spectrum, was a balanced first step towards reform. And I want to thank Mr. Jordan and Mr. Biggs for being strong partners in the effort to achieve reform. And as Mr. Jordan uh, mentioned, this bill passed the uh, uh, Judiciary Committee on a bipartisan vote of 35 to 2. Can't think of anything else that passes the Judiciary Committee of anything like that. But our attempts to reform and reauthorize Section 702 are beginning to appear Sisyphean. This is my third time appearing before your committee on a FISA bill this Congress. Yet not one of these appearances has resulted in the House floor vote. While I remain hopeful that we will eventually enact common sense measures to rein in abuse of FISA Section 702 surveillance powers, I question the wisdom of repeatedly offering the same legislation and crossing our fingers that we will get a different result. <clears throat> this fe past February, I told you that while I didn't agree with the Speaker's approach of putting a neutral bill before the whole House and allowing Judiciary and Hipsy to fight over amendments, I was still willing to play his game. Two months later, nothing has changed. Except for a small change to the amendment process, the House bill still reflects a clear absence of agreement between Hipsy and Judiciary. And as with last time, Rather than employing any of the other options available to him, the Speaker would have us vote on all of the items of controversy individually. This strategy is so unwieldy that if two or three of the expected amendments are adopted in combination, there may be nobody who will support the bill, depending which amendments are, 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 are approved. The modest reforms in the Reforming Intelligence of Securing America Act are indeed unobjectionable. But they are also so modest that they would prove ineffective. And we have the numbers to back that up. In 2021, in response to repeated criticism from the FISA court, the FBI instituted an internal reform for U.S. person queries of the 702 database. While these changes forced a 90 percent reduction in noncompliance, the FBI was still left with an average of more than 200,000 compliance incidents every year. The FBI's self-imposed query restrictions did not prevent searches for over 100 Black Lives Matter protesters. They did not prevent the batch query of over 19,000 donors to an unnamed congressional candidate. And they did not stop over 278,000 other noncompliant FBI queries of the, 202, of, the set, of the 702 database that occurred in 2021. The single most important reform we can enact to combat these abuses is a pop probable cause requirement, probable cause warrant requirement, for U.S. person queries. One of the amendments you will see today would impose such a warrant requirement on searches using U.S. person identifiers with certain reasonable exceptions, such as cybersecurity cases, situations with victim consent, and in exigent circumstances. This warrant requirement is the reform we need to protect Americans <coughs> and to allow surveillance laws to continue to <coughs> keep us safe while also protecting our essential liberties. It is simply unfair to ask the intelligence community to both zealously, zealously protect our security while also protecting the constitutional rights of those surveilled. America's system of checks and balances exists precisely for cases such as this, where two, where two considerations must coexist at odds with one another. For too long, FISA Section 702 has enabled the surveillance of Americans without adequate safeguards to protect our civil liberties. Americans need Congress to enact those guardrails, and with Section 702 expiring soon, we have a rare opportunity to protect Americans' privacy while giving law enforcement the tools they need to keep us safe. But we don't have unlimited time to get this right. The extension to Section 702 that the House passed last December expires April 19th, 10 days from now. I stand ready to vote on this legislation so long as a probable cause warrant requirement is adopted, and I encourage my colleagues to join me in supporting real reform. Thank you, and I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you very much for your testimony. We'll now turn to my good friend, uh, Chairman of the Intelligence Committee, Mr. Turner, for any opening statement he cares to make. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, thank you for having us. Uh, we're very <laughs> pleased to be here with what is an excellent reform bill. 
Uh, Mr. McGovern raised the question as to why are we so late? Uh, this is uh, the uh, Section 702 of the Foreign Surveillance Act expired December 31st. But we've had this period of time where we have had to have serious review of the intelligence community's failures and their abuses of some of the most critical tools that we give them to keep our nation safe. Uh, no question, we are here, as Mr. McGovern asked, because the intelligence community failed us. Uh, the FBI failed us, the intelligence community failed to properly police themselves, and they abused the, the tools that we gave them under FISA. There were searches of Americans' identities in the 702 database that should never have occurred. And there was a presidential candidate, ultimately President of the United States, President Trump, who had his own campaign team brought before the FISA court and actual warrants, probable cause warrants, issued in the, in the FISA court in what was the most egregious um, defrauding of a court system that we have had in our political system, where they went to the court and entered in what was basically political opposition research that had been paid for by the Hillary Clinton campaign and the Democratic National Committee to obtain warrants to surveil an individual who was associated with uh, the Donald Trump campaign. We are here only this late because we've had to struggle with these abuses. These are not abuses of Congress. In fact, Congress is the one that ferreted these out. By law and statute, we required that the intelligence community report to us their uses of FISA and their searches of US persons within the 702 database. And those abuses are the ones that we, the Intelligence Committee, pulled together a joint group between the Judiciary Committee and the Intelligence Committee to be able to identify real reforms. This bill, the underlying bill, provides 55 reforms, both to the FISA court process, to the FBI's processes, and to the use and the collection of 702 data that go right to the heart of the actual abuses. They're not stabs into the dark. They are actual definitional responses to each of the abuses that we found. Now, the chair and ranking member of the Judiciary Committee unfortunately want to, to debate an amendment that's coming up rather than the solutions that we provided. And I want to first focus on those solutions. Together, the Judiciary Committee and the Intelligence Committee came up with 55 recommendations that reform the FBI querying process, basically taking it out of the hands of the rank and file of the FBI. We found that their abuses were so egregious that the FBI was broken and we had no ability to continue to trust the system. So we elevated and limited their use of a 702 FISA information. Um, we made certain that the FISA court itself could not ever again be subject to the, the political abuses that occurred in the, in the Trump campaign. And in all of these, we went back and made criminal penalties for anyone who violates these new higher standards. We also gave um, specifically an opportunity for Congress in its oversight to increase its oversight of these so that we can ensure that the criminal prosecutions occur for those who might violate these provisions in the future. Now, um, the chair and ranking of judiciary are, are talking about imposing a warrant on the search of 702 information. And I want to make a few things clear. There is no warrantless searches of American citizens' data. That does not occur under FISA. It's not permissible under FISA. It's illegal. They don't even have the mechanism within which to do it. They, do, they survey foreigners located abroad and a limited subset. It's about 250,000 people. It is subject to court supervision. And, that, and the court supervision is determining that each of those individuals represents a national security threat, a foreigner abroad, national security threat to the United States. So what would their warrant requirement be then? If it's foreigners that are abroad, what would their requirement be? It would be to go in to the head of ISIS, to go into the head of Hamas's data, and look in that data that where Americans' names and American citizens who are communicating with Hamas and ISIS may be. It's not going into Americans' data. There is, there is no warrantless spying on Americans under 702 or FISA. There is no ability to go into American data under this law except with a warrant. There already under the law is a requirement that if you're going to go into Americans' data, 
that you must get a warrant. The requirement that they're asking for is a warrant if you go into Hamas's data and look at, at Americans that are corresponding with Hamas, or if you go into ISIS data and look at ISIS data for Americans that are corresponding with ISIS. Now, first off, there's no, there is no constitutional requirement for that. The courts have already ruled that you have no constitutional right to privacy as an American to, to correspond with an ISIS head who's a foreigner located abroad. That is not protected communication. Now, your communications remain protected. We can't go into your, um, into your communication, into your data without a warrant. But if you communicate with ISIS, the head of ISIS or the head of Hamas, you lose your constitutional protection under those communications. If we're spying on the head of Hamas, which you and Americans would want us to do, your communications are going to be caught up at the head of Hamas. To impose a warrant requirement is dangerous for America. The Wall Street Journal stated, Section 702 lets the government monitor non-U.S. citizens outside the United States to protect national security. Don't let anybody tell you this is a warrantless program surveying Americans. The House Judici Judiciary Committee has gone the wrong way. The legislation that could end up, that could end Section 702's, uh, it would make it useless as a national security tool. The bill would require their amendment, a warrant for queries of U.S. persons even though the information is already collected. In other words, what the, what, what the Wall Street Journal is, is indicating is if you collect Hamas's data, you shouldn't need a warrant to look at Hamas's data, even if an American is in there. If an American is communicating with Hamas, it's a national security threat. We should not have a warrant. It will shut down our ability to be effective. I yield back. Thank you very much. We now turn to my good friend, the distinguished ranking member of the Intelligence Committee, Mr. Himes. Uh, you're recognized for any opening statement you care to make. Thank you, Chairman Cole and Ranking Member McGovern for the opportunity to speak about the Reforming Intelligence and Securing America Act of 2024. I'm going to state something that hasn't been stated, but it's critical. Section 702 is our single most important intelligence collection authority, bar none, full stop. Almost 60 percent of the articles in the President's daily brief have or contain information from the 702 collection program. And the intelligence community uses this program every single day to keep Americans safe. For more than a year, the Intelligence Committee has worked diligently and collaboratively to reauthorize Section 702, starting from the premise that it is essential that we reauthorize it, but that we cannot and will not do so without very strong reforms. All members of the Intelligence Committee have been deeply engaged in that effort. We have hosted briefings, both classified and unclassified, for members and staff to educate the staff on the complexities of Section 702. HIPSI's oversight demonstrated the value of Section 702, but it also found, as my colleagues have said, genuine problems in how Section 702 has been used and room for important reforms. Those problems are primarily within the FBI, where the Bureau for many years demonstrated an unacceptable record on compliance with the standards for querying U.S. persons. Thankfully, the robust systems of audit and oversight of Section, 02, uh, Section 702 that Congress has previously put in place identified those shortcomings, and we are now in a position to take corrective action. I would also point out, as I believe the Chairman of the Judiciary Committee said, that uh, internal changes inside the FBI have already dramatically improved, both reduced the number of U.S. person queries by 90 percent, and we're at a point now where less than 1 percent of FBI queries are noncompliant. The bill before the Rules Committee today includes many of the extensive reforms that the Intelligence Committee and the Judiciary Oversight efforts identified. The more than 50 reforms are aimed directly at the problems that have arisen while ensuring that this authority can continue to keep Americans safe. In the interest of time, I won't describe all of the reforms contained in the base text, but I will just mention a few. The bill would institute a flat prohibition on queries conducted by the FBI to uncover, quote, evidence of a crime. A flat ban on all queries for evidence of a crime will help drive compliance and make clear that this is an intelligence tool, not a law enforcement tool. This bill would also reduce by 90 percent the number of individuals at the FBI who can approve a U.S. person query. This will reduce compliance failures and ensure that every time the FBI queries the FISA 702 data, it does so for a permissible purpose. And finally, this bill includes important reforms to the FISC, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court, most notably by requiring that the FISC appoint an amicus to represent the privacy rights of Americans each time the government seeks to renew its annual certification under 702. 
These are tough reforms that go well beyond what the administration was seeking, but they preserve the fundamental value of the program to protect American lives while balancing critical privacy rights. As everyone has mentioned, we will also debate multiple amendments. I plan to support some of those and oppose others. I expect the House will debate an amendment to apply a probable cause warrant, as we have heard uh, earlier, when the FBI or the IC searches lawfully collected 702 data using a, person, a U.S. person identifier. With great respect to my judiciary colleagues, this proposal is seriously misguided and would effectively ban U.S. person queries in nearly every instance. Let's be clear about something. FISA 702 has been re-annually certified every single year since 2009. The certification process involves presenting the 702 program to federal judges who then issue a certification every single year. In not one of those years between 2009 and the present have federal judges say that there is, that, that the querying of, the U, of, of U.S. persons in the database raises unreasonable search and seizure issues. Not once. No federal court has said that there is a constitutional violation here. So you may be uncomfortable with U.S. person queries, but you can't clothe that discomfort in constitutional concerns. I'll note that if I can just take a half a minute here, the reason the FBI does many of these queries is defensive. That is to say, a member of Congress is being discussed by Chinese intelligence officers. There's no real worry that the member of Congress is engaged in a crime, but obviously our intelligence community would like to know why Chinese intelligence officers are talking about a member of Congress and they would query it accordingly. There is no way you can make a defensive query uh, if you can't tell, tell a judge that you believe you'll turn up evidence of a crime. I would also sort of hark back to an analogy around 9-11. On 9-11, the failure was associated by the inability of intelligence and law enforcement to talk to each other. So as Chairman Turner said, if we pick up that an ISIS leader is talking to an individual in Los Angeles who is by definition a U.S. person, we have no idea why that conversation is occurring. It could be a family member or a friend. So you cannot go to a judge and say, we have no idea why this communication is occurring, but we want you to issue us a probable cause warrant. That is why the administration says that the passage of a warrant requirement would shut this program down. I'll just note that every ranking member that touches either foreign policy or national security, myself, ranking member Meeks, ranking member Smith, ranking member Thompson, former Speaker Pelosi, former Majority Leader Hoyer, will vote against this amendment. The amendment also goes a lot further than the PCLOB, the President's Civil Liberty uh, Oversight Board recommended. They recommended a much, much more narrowly tailored amendment, and yet this judiciary amendment goes way beyond what the PCLOB recommended. It goes way beyond what Senator Durbin has recommended. So while the sentiment is one that perhaps I understand, this is an extreme amendment, and I hope it is voted down. Uh, once again, I want to thank Chairman Turner for his leadership on the bill and the leadership of the Judiciary Committee. And I also want to note my appreciation to both committees for working so hard on this. Thank you for the opportunity to appear before the committee today, and I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you very much. Uh, just in the interest of time, the chair will at least for now forego questions. So I'll turn to my good friend from Minnesota for any questions she may have for our panel. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I just have a, a real, well, maybe quick. Um, <laughs> but for uh, Chairman Turner and Chairman Jordan, uh, you know, can you discuss how the uh, this is the appropriate balance between empowering law enforcement and respecting civil rights or liberties? This is a really good opportunity for us, I think, to get an agreement from everybody who's here, right? Because because one of the issues that we always have whenever we're discussing FISA is it gets so confusing of the fact that we're only talking about one foreign intelligence tool. I mean, there are all types of other issues that judiciary has to deal with and we have to deal with. But I, I think, first off, before we go forward, we should probably get an agreement between the four of us so that at least the Rules Committee has an understanding that we're, we're all talking about the same thing. 702 is foreign surveillance of foreigners abroad. <coughs> Can, can we have universal agreement between the four of us? Because it is what the law states. It is, and I have it in front of me. It limits. It is surveillance of foreigners abroad. Uh, Frank, you remember now there's a group. Mr. Mr. Chairman, Chairman, Mr. Chairman, is the witness supposed to direct his comments to us or to the other witnesses? Oh, actually, you're correct. You should address your comments, Well, well we're, we're a team, so I'm making certain that I consult with our team as we give the answer 
For the record, everyone has agreed, Chairman Jordan, Ranking Member Nadler, my Ranking Member, myself, in my framing your answer, <laughs> that we're talking about foreign surveillance of foreigners located abroad. Um, what we found in this, um, uh, in this process of 702, because there's two really big provisions we're dealing with. We're dealing with 702 and we're dealing with the, the court itself. They are, they are separate. Under 702, what we found is that the FBI had an unbelievable number of abuses where they were <coughs> routinely looking at this, the data of foreigners located abroad, searching it for Americans' data, and what they, wh whether or not Americans were located in that. What they found is their computer system was set up so it did it automatically. Um, they, they didn't have any criteria for determining whether or not Tom Cole was searched as to whether or not he was communicating with, with ISIS um, in, in any of their processes. They in she is not. <laughs> they changed those processes upon our uh, uh, raising these issues with them, where it's, as uh, Jim said, it was like 280,000 times that they, in a year, that they were violating that. That They reduced those down to 680. And what you'd find is that when they were <coughs> searching Hamas's data and ISIS data for unrelated Americans, 98% of the queries returned zero information because the informa those individuals we're not corresponding with the, the 250,000 people that we consider some of our most national sec security uh, threats or, or issues. So what we've done in this, though, is that we've limited the number of people who can do it. So we've, we've made the standards higher, the professionalism and training higher, and then we've put on it real uh, consequences, uh, real criminal uh, prosecutions for, uh, for uh, intentional violations and for those who uh, use this information inappropriately, on the court side, we really nailed it down. Uh, we made it certain that um, uh, information and data was not admissible before court. If someone did so, that was used against the Trump administration, if someone did so, they had criminal prosecution. Uh, we um, made certain that if it's a U.S. person, that an, in, that an independent attorney is appointed and is part of the process to be a counter to um, ensure that the laws are followed. And we also um, made certain that there, is, that there is a hearing and a transcript, and that that data is made available if there should be subsequent um, uh, uh, pr legal proceedings so that the American citizen would have access to it and be able to challenge it. Uh, I would just respond by saying we have no problem with surveilling foreigners. It's the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance mm -hmm. Act, as, as, the ranking, or as the chairman just said. What we have a concern about is a term that Ranking Member Himes, I think, used four times in his presentation, U.S. person queries. And that's a fancy way of saying U.S. person searches. They are searching Americans. So that is our concern. And we know, we know, not according to Jerry Nadler and Jim Jordan, but according to the Washington Post and information we've, we've, uh, we've received from the Inspector General and others, the FBI, this is quoting straight from Mr. Barrett's piece a year ago, the FBI has misused a powerful digital surveillance tool more than 278,000 times, including against crime victims, January 6 riot suspects, people arrested at protests in the wake of the police killing of George Floyd in 2020, and in one case, as the ranking member referenced, 19,000 donors to a congressional candidate, according to a newly unsealed court document. That has nothing to do with Hamas or Hezbollah. That's U.S. person searches, not queries, searches of their information. And the, the, the author goes on to say, the failure to use this 702 database correctly when collecting information about U.S. citizens and others make it harder for the agency to marshal support for Congress to renew the law. That's why we're saying information picked up in this, what is becoming a bigger and bigger haystack of information, information about American citizens, U.S. persons in there, if you're going to query that. You're going to use a phone number, an email, or a name, as the ranking member said. You should go get a warrant to do that. That, that is the crux of the matter. Of course we want to, bad guys overseas, of course you want to surveil them. But we're not talking about, we're talking about the term that Mr. Himes, again, used several times in his opening statement, U.S. persons. This is why this is so important that we had the, the agreement before I start answering your question. Yes. Because what Jim said is absolutely right. 
I mean, the abuses were horrific. I mean, the whole fact that people who were arrested in, in, during the George, George Floyd riots yeah. had their names searched in Hamas's data is an absolute violation. Now, in, under 702, the people who were arrested for protesting for George Floyd, under 702, they didn't go search their data. They went and searched Hamas's data and ISIS data. The problem is, is that, that Jim and, and Ranking Member Nadler want to have a warrant to search Hamas's data and ISIS's data. There's already a warrant requirement to go and search an American's data, to go and search their data. But if you're going to go look in Hamas or ISIS, and you're an American citizen that's corresponded with ISIS or Hamas, there should not be a warrant to look at that data. With all due respect, I think the, uh, the chairman misunderstands the bill or, or the situation. Of course you don't need a warrant to surveil Hamas. No one claims you do. But when it comes to surveilling an American person, a U.S. person, like any other situation, you should need a warrant. But that that is yes. the law. It is not the law. It, it is absolutely well, the law. Well, it is the law. I mean, right now, under the law, if you, have to, if you are going to surveil case, an American citizen, you need a warrant. It's which, only if you're searching Hamas's data or ISIS data that you don't need a warrant, and that's what you want to put a, da well, a warrant if, on. If, and, and I think the American citizens believe that if somebody is corresponding with Hamas and ISIS, mm -hmm. for example, if they send them an email that says, thanks for the bomb-making classes, we ought not get, have to get a warrant to look in Hamas's data that we have to find out that they thanked them for bomb-making well, classes. The, again, if you want to search Hamas, that's fine, and no one claims you need a warrant. If you want to search a U.S. person, you should need a warrant. Now, you say we do already. Right, right. But uh, let me finish. Okay, so you say we do. If we do, then the amendment that the Judiciary Committee proposes requiring such a warrant should not be objectionable no, to no, you. No, that's not what your warrant says. So let's go over it, because I mean, I, we have it, and I think certainly for the Rules Committee, people have to vote. I mean, if, if, you're, if there's confusion among the four of us as to what your amendment does, then we need to clear it up. Your amendment says that there would be a warrant required to look in 702 data, which is foreigners located abroad's data, the 250,000 that we identify as the most national security threat, as an American who has communicated with them. No, That's you, what your amendment no, that no, says. You, mis you misunderstand the amendment. What the amendment says is that if Hamas, whom we are properly surveilling, or any other people for that matter, the Chinese communists, whoever we're, we're, we're surveilling abroad, we find that they communicate with an American. Now, we have the metadata. But under your amendment, you can uh, uh, Excuse yeah. me. Excuse let let, let Mr. Nadler, uh, I'd like to hear what yeah. he's having Sorry. to say. Well, I'm just going to remind our witnesses, please don't talk to one another. Talk to the panel. We and please don't talk over one another. Yeah. It's very we difficult. We have the tonight. metadata. That is to say, the name and phone number, or presumably the phone number, of the American person that Hamas, or whoever, uh, abroad, called. If we want to know, however, what, if we want to surveil all the phone records of that American person, like any other search, you ought to need a warrant. That's current law. It is not current law. If it is current law, then the amendment that we have here saying that a probable cause warrant to conduct a U.S. person search of the 702 database with limited exceptions for exigency, cybersecurity, and victim consent should not be objectionable. No, no, no. And, what you and, just and, said. Excuse me. Uh, Sorry. I, I Again, I asked understand. you not to interrupt one another, not to talk to one another, answer the gentlelady's question. And, and I was going to ask Chairman Jordan because I, I was curious. If, if there was some uh, another answer in between, <laughs> okay. I, I agree with I agree with uh, Ranking Member Nader. It's why we put the amendment. And understand, we have exceptions in the amendment. That Mr. Spock yep. say, if it's an emergency situation, and you think the time element or whatever time element that is, even though it's constitutional, there's an emergency situation, or if there's a permission. The example that I think the ranking member of the Intelligence Committee gave, if a member, if, if two people in China are talking about a member of Congress. 
go talk to that member of Congress and say, hey, do you care, do you care if we query this database? Because we think these guys are trying to target you in some way. Of course, that individual, that member of Congress, go ahead, figure it out. We want to know what the Chinese are trying to do to a member of Congress. And then the third one is if it's a known, known cybersecurity threat, some known malware that's been used, that's an exception as well. So we tried to structure this, this warrant requirement with some exceptions, which, so frankly, we're giving on the side of, of the Judiciary Committee in the way we structured this because we get this national security issue, but we also get the Constitution. And we also get this fundamental principle that it's a separate and equal, we have separate and equal branches of government to put a check. You don't want the executive branch being able to just not follow the rules or the rules that are in place, they get to do their own thing. That's why we have a separate and equal branch that has to okay it when you're going to go get information about an American citizen. I, I will just say thank you very much, and I'll yield back, Mr. Chair. Thank, thank, thank you. Thank the gentlelady. I now turn to my good friend, the distinguished ranking member, for any questions he asks. Yeah, just, just, just briefly, I mean, this is all a fascinating discussion. It's clear that you don't agree with each other. So, um, we agree. no, you guys agree. You know, <laughs> the, 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 I guess my, my, here, here, let me just kind of cut to the chase. Um, you know, uh, this is the third time we're we're up here. Um, I mean, on the intelligence committee, I mean, do you object? to having the Rules Committee make and order the uh, warrant amendment? No, we, we do not. Okay. Uh, what we, what, and we, we, but we do think that the debate needs to be clear as I, to I, what I, I the warrant that. requires, and, and I glorious, encourage everyone but, to read it. But it, so if the Rules Committee makes that amendment in order, you're okay with it, right? And if the Rules Committee doesn't make it in order, I don't know how the rule passes. That's, that's your guys' concern. Right. Well, so if, it's, if, it's be, if, if we're all in agreement that it should be made in order, hopefully it be made in order, and we can debate this on the floor. Yep. Right? Well said. Okay. Then I have no, do we, I have no questions. Thank you. Gentlemen from Kentucky, should recognize for any questions you may have for the panel. Let's see. Um, Mr. Jordan was, uh, sorry, Chairman Jordan. Was the 702 FISA program used to spy on a presidential candidate or, or his campaign? I, I, I don't know. I don't think so. What I do know is that's, that's the other part of FISA, the FISA court. That process was abused, and there's some, some measures in here to try to uh, alleviate that, but I don't know. So, was, so the FISA court, though, the FISA program, not 702, but right. some part of the program was used to spy on a presidential campaign? Yep. Is that, is that true? So, there, so, so there, there are no allegations that 702 was used to spy on President Trump's campaign. The provisions of the FISA court that we have reforms for that actually their amendment does not relate to um, would prevent the types of abuses that, uh, that resulted in Carter Page having warrants issued against him. And was that done illegally? <clears throat> I believe that they defrauded the court. The, the, the actual review of it has not resulted in anyone being found to have, um, uh, to have defrauded the court. What we have done in the reforms, which again, their amendment does not relate to or touch the FISA court or the Carter Page issue or the Trump issue, our amendments tighten up the operations of the court so that this can never happen again. We exclude from evidence uh, any political opposition research. We exclude from evidence any um, news articles. We appoint an attorney for any U.S. persons that goes be that where a warrant application is before the court to review the application and advise the court. Uh, we require uh, that every person that submit information as part of the investigation process um, certify under oath the material that they're providing to the court so that they're subject to both pe perjury penalties and also criminal uh, prosecutions for defrauding the court. What we did is we went back and every place where we believe that they had violated the, the um, Carter Page's rights or the court processes, um, we put a reform in place. And again, their amendment um, doesn't ad address that. We're all in agreement that these amendments that we have in place on, on the FISA court are important. Mr. Jordan. I'm just going to add one thing. There, there was one individual found guilty of, of uh, lying to the court. Kevin Kleinsmith was found guilty of that in that whole process. So there was someone who was held to account. Not, not nearly enough in my judgment, but there was one. The, that's actually the, uh, the question I was asking. So was somebody found guilty of abusing the FISA program to spy on a, a presidential campaign? Well, Chairman Turner. 
Because Chairman said, Turner. Yeah, Kevin Klein Smith was. Yeah, I'm asking Chairman Turner. Right. So there, there were. It was found in the, the um, uh, in the process that there was an individual that actually um, um, modified an email and submitted it through the process. Now, under our amendments, that individual would have much more severe consequences, and they'd be found of both defrauding the court and perjury. Um, and um, uh, providing falsified evidence. Uh, so we have, we have made it now uh, that uh, as, as a significant deterrent factor so that anyone who is found to have done what he did or any of the other processes of individuals that were found that were not uh, prosecuted uh, would be prosecuted. But there was somebody found guilty of abusing the FISA program to spy on presidential campaign. It was an individual that was found to have modified, to submitted falsified evidence, which is different than the entire process that, that we right. identified like 10 things that we believe that were violated, and we, we provide amendments to reform that process. So and somebody- We're in agreement of these amendments. Right. Somebody broke the law to use the FISA program to spy on a presidential campaign. Is that correct? I, we're all in agreement on that. Mr. Hans. Did somebody break the law to abuse the FISA program to spy on President Trump's campaign? My understanding is the same as Chairman Turner's and Chairman Jordan's, which is that there was an individual who was uh, prosecuted for some process failure in applying for an affidavit under Title I of FISA, which is distinct from 702. Distinct from 702, but this is, this is not some right-wing conspiracy. I just want to get this out there. There was somebody in the government who abused the FISA program to spy on Donald Trump's campaign, and they've been uh, found guilty of falsifying information. Is that correct, Mr. Himes? That's my understanding, yes. Okay. Um, let's see. So, uh, Mr. Turner, Chairman Turner, you said there are 250,000 targets overseas, and you characterize oh, them. About. Okay, roughly. And you characterize them as heads of Hamas and heads of ISIS. Wouldn't there be other people as well? Could there, in fact, be people in Germany who are staffing the, the heads of state there? Or could there be, is there anything to prevent, for instance, members of parliament from being uh, among those 250,000? The category, which is a, a process that, by which the intelligence community goes to the, the FISA court and has the, the, uh, the individuals who are subject to uh, surveillance reviewed, includes categories that, that also relate to uh, national security threats, foreign intelligence uh, threats. And, um, and so there are broader individuals. There are not, as I was indicating, we don't look at Paul McCartney. Uh, we don't. We don't look at uh, you know the head of Airbus. Um, we look at only those issues uh, that are related to national security. National security threats. Mr. Massey, could I? Yes, Mr. Nadler. Foreign foreigners do not have constitutional rights. Americans have constitutional rights, which is why we need the uh, fourth the, the, the search the uh, search amendment. Um, if the intelligence community thinks that a member of parliament or a staff member of the uh, German chancellor is spying for uh, Putin or, or the Chinese communists, they can certainly surveil that person. And they may find that it's true or it may not. They can surveil anybody who is not an American citizen um, without under, under FISA. And there's no, nothing to stop them, and there's no reason they should be stopped. Mr. Turner, so let me ask this again. Um, could, a, could a member of parliament in Germany or one of the um, executive branch bureaucrats in Germany be targeted under the FISA uh, 702 program? Absolutely. Yeah, Mr. Himes. Let me just make this point because it hasn't come out. The roughly 250,000 foreign targets must fall into one of several categories. They are counterproliferation, counterterrorism, foreign intelligence activities. If an individual doesn't fall into that category of suspicion, they could not be added to the target list. So it's important that we understand that, that there is a, a uh, filter that targets must pass through 
that indicates that they may be involved, they might be a foreign intelligence officer involved in, in proliferation or terrorism in order to get on that target list. So no, the government can't simply pick uh, a, a minister of parliament in the UK or in Germany and put them on the list without a justification in one of those categories. Well, seem, they've got 250,000 people. I just find it hard to believe there's that many heads of Hamas and heads of ISIS. Could a business person end up on this list for traveling to, let's say, Russia uh, to work on some business deals in, in Moscow? Well, to be clear, Mr. Massey, between Russia, China, Iran, North Korea, you probably have hundreds of thousands of intelligence officers who would be legitimate targets under the foreign officer of an intelligence service. Uh, a business person, just to ask to answer your question, could only be put on the target list if they were suspected of being involved in terrorism, proliferation, or a foreign intelligence officer. Can I, can I Go ahead, you? Chairman so, Turner. Um, one of the things that's difficult in, in all of these discussions is that, you know, obviously there are a number of the different intelligence programs and intellig intelligence gathering arms of, of, of the United States government. We're dealing with 702. Um, 702 is foreigners located abroad, of which there's national security interest. What you just described, uh, for example, right now Russia is subject to um, uh, sanctions. And uh, if there is an individual who is a, an American who is currently violating those sanctions, um, they could be subject to uh, being caught up in surveillance of that Russian that they're doing business with because they're violating the law. That's not, that's not 702. Seven, we, are, we don't do sanction um, uh, enforcement. Um, under, under 702. So, um, so let's say, I'm just to pick a name, Mary Catherine sends 10,000 emails. She's an American, never been abroad, always lived in the United States. She sends 10,000 emails in a year, 2, 000, makes 2,000 phone calls, 5,000 texts, 500 direct messages uh, on her social media uh, platform. And let's see, let's say, 0.1% of those are caught up in the FISA 702 program. Why wouldn't you need a warrant to go after those emails that are in the FISA program that, that were ostensibly collected in pursuit of a foreign agent? Why does Mary Catherine only have protection over some of her communications? Well, it's the same as if you and I communicate. I mean, if, if I send an email to you, um, and it's then in your data. It's not, it's not my data. But, but what's the principle that requires you to get a warrant to search, you know, all of that stuff, but not some of that stuff? Well, again, it's not that stuff. It's because we're not searching Mary Catherine. If to search Mary's, her, material, to search Mary's material, you would need a warrant, and you would need a warrant <coughs> based upon probable cause, and that is, as I was saying to the ranking member, current law. Now, for those that she sends to individuals that are subject to surveillance, if she sends one to Vladimir Putin and it ends up in Vladimir Putin's data, again, I send an email to you, I'm in your data, that's no longer my data, um, the, you don't need a warrant if you're looking at Vladimir Putin's just because Mary sent an email to Vladimir Putin. Now, if you wanted to go look at Mary's data under current law, and there's been no allegation in any 702 uh, of the abuses that we're remedying here, that, that Mary's dad is searched without a warrant. It's Vladimir Putin's that's searched without a warrant, and if Mary's in there, then, then that's Vladimir's dad and not Mary's. I like that you keep going back to Vladimir Putin and the heads of Hamas now that we've established that members of the German parliament or uh, bureaucrats within the German government could be part of this. And my point is this, if Mary Catherine has 20,000 communications and she's a red-blooded American, and a hundred of them get swept up in your program, then why doesn't she get her constitutional rights for those 100? Why would you deprive her? The, the, I'm not saying they're going to Putin or the head of Hamas. Mary Catherine has no interest in communicating with them. Somehow one of them goes to somebody in Germany that's on your list that has no constitutional rights. Why does she give up her constitutional rights just because she's communicating with somebody who has no constitutional rights. She hasn't surrendered her constitutional rights. Again, back to... You're surrendering I, her constitutional I, rights under say this program. I, let's say I email you. 
and let's say you're subject to a warrant and they take your phone, which has happened to other members of Congress, and my, and my email is in your phone. They don't need a warrant separately to read my email to you if they have a warrant for your phone. This is a probable cause warrant, which is what they were calling for. If, if your data is lawfully taken, then there's no requirement to look at my data in yours uh, with a separate warrant. You don't have to get a separate warrant to look at everybody's information that's in somebody's data if you have a warrant to look at theirs. In this program, if we have the ability to, to survey, and everyone in the entire country would want us to, Vladimir Putin, if you email Vladimir Putin, you don't have constitutional protections of that email to Vladimir Putin. You do have all of your other emails. To go look in your data, you would have to have a probable cause warrant that shows that somehow you violated the laws. And by, by the way, there's no law that you violated in corresponding with Vladimir Putin. If you sent him an email, though, that did in indicate that you were like a gun runner or doing something that was illegal, then, and only then, then the government would still have to go to court to look at your data. They can't just go and look at your, follow through and take your data. Let me, let me see if I understand the legal principle here. Americans have constitutional rights to privacy except for when they're communicating with somebody who doesn't have a constitutional right to privacy. If they are communicating with foreigners located abroad for which that foreigner does not have constitutional rights to their data, we do not apply the United States Constitution to foreigners located abroad. A small subset of foreigners located abroad, those which rise to the level of being a national security threat, we do spy on. The, the American public would want us to spy on individuals that, that are a threat to our country. If you communicate with one of those individuals, yes, your emails, your data that are in that individual, the head of ISIS, the head of Hamas, Vladimir Putin, um, are subject to, to intercept. And, they, and courts have ruled, regardless of what this law says, uh, courts have ruled are not subject to any additional protection. Your data remains protected but not those that you've communicated to a foreigner abroad. Mr. Nadler. I think, yes, Mr. Ch Ranking Member Nadler. Thank you. Um, if, a far, if, 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 you, if, a, if you're communicating with a foreigner and for some reason this foreigner is, is being surveilled by, by the United States, they will catch your communication. They know what you said, presumably they're wiretapping it, they know what you said to the foreigner, they know what the foreigner said to you. Fine. But if they now want to look at, because you're communicating with Vladimir Putin, they suspect, even though all you said to him was uh, happy birthday, but since you're communicating with him, they suspect that maybe you're up to no good, and they want to search all your communications. They need to warn. <clears throat> you should need a warrant, and that's what our that's amendment what says. No, no. Under current FISA law, you would not need a warrant. Under the bill in, in chief, you would not need a warrant, and that's why we are putting in a probable cause uh, amendment, a, a probable cause warrant amendment, which we hope will be made in order. Mr. Matthew, if I could just Go ahead. one moment. Um, that, that, um, it, is not, it is not accurate. Uh, there, the current law, not this amendment, requires that if any, if the government is going to go look at an American's data or information, that a probable cause warrant is required. It, 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 is, it, is, it, is, um, it is not accurate to say the government can, can do so. And I'm going to read into the record their actual amendment, because their amendment does not say if they go to look at American's data. Their amendment says, except as provided in some paragraphs B and C, no <laughs> officer or employee of the United States may conduct a query of information acquired under this section, which is 702, for the purposes of finding communications or information, the compelled productions of which will require a probable cause warrant. It's a warrant to look at Hamas, ISIS, Vladimir Putin. Current law requires, even if the, without this amendment, current law requires to look at your data, Mary's data, or anyone else, that they get a warrant. I wouldn't want anyone to think otherwise. These are queries of the 702 database, which is why right. Mr. Turner is incorrect. How big is the 702 database, Mr. Chairman Turner? I, I, I can't tell you. Obviously, 
the extent of which the database is. It is the data of foreigners located abroad, of which there are about 250,000 that are court supervised, that are identified as um, national security threats or national security intelligence uh, targets as a result of the, the uh, threats and protection for the United States. Is some of that data collected uh, domestically because it goes through the U U.S. servers? Mr. Hyman. Mr. Massey, if I may, <clears throat> the reason this program exists is because it is compelled process, that is to say, served to largely U.S. service providers. If we were simply pulling emails out of the air in a foreign country, no such, no such process would be required. But because process is being served to email providers, text providers, et cetera, that's why this program exists. And it's hard to answer your question about size because for those roughly 250,000 targets, all of whom are foreigners, uh, some could be very prolific with their emails and their texts, but it's important to bound the number of Americans who are likely to have their information in the database. The only way a US person, an American, could have their information in this database is if they are communicating with one of these foreign targets. My guess would be that that's probably vanishingly small. I don't know how many people in this room are in regular email contact with Russian intelligence agents or members of Hamas, but it's probably vanishingly small. Now, if this were truly a constitutional issue, that argument would fail. But again, since you ask constitutional questions, Mr. Massey, I would say that since 2009, federal judges uh, appointed by presidents of all political stripes have at no point in time found a constitutional issues with a U.S. person query. So um, let's talk about the abuses. Mr. Nadler, how many abuses, or Mr. Jordan, whoever wants to speak to this, did the, did the FBI or the IG admit that we're going on? Well, it's, been reported, it's been reported 278,000. 278,000. Is there, was there ever an instance of somebody, like what kind of abuses are there? Is there ever an instance of somebody going in looking for an ex-wife or a girlfriend or putting some search terms on somebody they're thinking yeah. about dating, for instance, or? Yeah, there, 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 ha there has been, uh, Mr. Massey, there has been that. And as I pointed out, there was a, one done to a congressional candidate uh, campaign. Uh, and of course, the best examples are, you know, in the, in the summer 2020, uh, people in the BLM uh, protest and, and riots around the country, there was, there was uh, queries done there. So, um, Mr. Mr. Turner, when somebody uses this program to go in and look for an ex-wife or a girlfriend or a boyfriend information on them, do you, do you think they're going in there because they think their uh, wife may have talked with the head of Hamas? It seems to me like there'd be a lot more information in there if they're interested in abusing the program, they're just not going to—they're not going to find out anything on somebody by looking into this database. If all it's got is interactions with villains, Mr. Massey, the the abuses were horrific, um, and as a result of the committee's work, I mean, here's here's your, here's the graph, by the way. Here's what 278,000 look like. The FBI, as a result of the intelligence community's oversight, instituted changes to their own procedures and limitations and also increased oversight, resulting in the number of, of these abuses dropping from 278,000 to 610. This is what the two bar charts look like. That's not enough. We need to make certain that the FBI has very limited access overall to this data as a result of the abuses themselves. That's why our, uh, and their joint, you know, all four of us are before you in favor of the underlying bill. Uh, that's why our response is to punish both the FBI, restructure the FBI, limit the FBI's availability and access to address those abuses. Mr. Mr. Massey, yeah. let me uh, correct Mayor. that. Uh, I believe Mr. Jordan and I and are only in favor of the underlying bill if the warrant requirement amendment is adopted. Yep. Um, uh, Mr. Turner, Chairman Turner, how many people have access to this database today? 
to run queries, searches on American. So the, the actual number, um, we're going to uh, give you an approximation is around 10,000. And what we're going to go to is uh, around 550 to give you a comparison. We are significantly restricting both the level of as to who has access and the number that has access and the review of those who access it. So 10,000 people had access to it, and you th does this have a number? Approximately. Um, so explain to me how you, you think the intelligence community wants to use this program. Is it, because I think I heard this before, they said if there, let's say there was a, a protest here at the Capitol, um, which it's legal to exercise your First Amendment rights, there, there's a protest here at the Capitol. Let's say they're uh, protesting um, the treatment of uh, Palestinians. Would, they, would they, the intel community use that, uh, the fact that they showed up at a, at a protest of that nature to go into this uh, database and see if those people, had, as you said, took bomb-making lessons and sent an email saying, thank you very much for the bomb-making lesson? Well, those are two different things. I mean, if someone sends a, an email to Hamas or ISIS and says, thank you for the bomb making classes, and that email is found, to look further into that individual's data <clears throat> under the Constitution and-, and Right, that's not my question. Would require, that's what you we're said. Getting, no, 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 we're getting far away from my question. It my is question is, if somebody's uh, protesting the treatment of Palestinians here at the Capitol, would that- uh, That is not- does, does the, what, what does somebody need that has access to this database to go search? Do they need probable cause? So, Mr. Massey. Let, let, uh, let, me, let me ask Mr. Turner real quick, and then I'll ask, give you a chance to answer. The, do they need probable, insufficient. yeah. Do they need probable cause to go looking in the 702 database, or would appearance at a protest be enough? No, appearance at a protest is not enough. So why not require probable cause? Probable cause for? To go search in the 702 database to, uh, let me, I'm asking Mr. Turner, thanks, Mr. Himes, I'll give you a chance to answer. Why not require probable cause to go into that database? The database. On, for an, an American. Okay, are you gonna stop answering your question so I can, ask your question so I can answer it? Are we, are we finished? I, it, no, we, it, we don't it, have five minutes here. It, it I want to, we have plenty of time, so you take as much as you want. Great. My friend Chip Roy's coming from the airport. I'd be glad to let you have 30 minutes. Excellent. Your question, which I think is an important one, is if an American protests, specifically the issue of treatment of Palestinians, is that sufficient? No. And in fact, as Chairman Jordan was saying, individuals who protest with respect to the treatment of George Floyd, that was insufficient, and those were deemed abuses. So why not require probable cause? That's my question, Mr. Turner. Right. So the, the issue of, of probable cause is that it's the, the, the data that is already collected on the individuals that are foreigners located abroad have no constitutional protections. The head of Hamas, the head of ISIS, Vladimir Putin has no constitutional protections. That data is validly collected data by the United States government. It is important intelligence information that is used to keep America safe. Searching that data does not require a warrant. Right. So but you have some prohibition on searching that data. I'm trying to understand why you have prohibitions, but then you don't want the Constitution to be a prohibition. Where does the Constitution get in your way? The Constitution applies, and, and, and as I said, if you, in collecting foreigners' information abroad, find that there's communications of which you, you believe that there may be evidence that an American is committing a crime, such as an email that says, thanks for the bomb making classes. That requires, as you and I were discussing, that that email then be brought to court and go through a probable cause, full warrant hearing 
to determine whether or not further information or data on an American citizen would be collected based upon a, pers uh, on a belief, probable cause based, determined by the court that they were committing a crime. Let me ask you differently. Under the framework you've established, somebody who shows up at a protest has an American who shows up at a protest in America, uh, you, you aren't constitutionally prohibited from going into the 702 database and searching for information on them. Is that correct? The 702 and FISA law is higher than the constitutional requirements, and in that law, we restrict the basis of searches and the, the basis upon which then that review occurs. And it's not my basis, it's the law that is, it was previously established by Congress. Well, if 702 has stricter protocols than even the Constitution, then what's I, I the problem with yeah. using the Constitution I, in I this didn't instance? Say stricter than the Constitution. You said higher requirements. I, the, the constitutional requirements on collecting data on foreigners abroad um, <clears throat> do not apply because they do not have constitutional rights. Yeah, I don't know why you're bringing that up. What I'm because asking that's you, the data. That's, what a, that's the data we're talking about. This law only applies, 702 only applies to data of foreigners located right. abroad. I'm not, I'm not saying you want to go collect more data on the protester. What I'm asking is, if somebody goes to a protest and they protest, is there, you're, uh, it's, I'm trying to understand, do you believe they have no constitutional uh, protections no, I didn't say if that. You, I didn't let me that. finish my question. Do you believe they have no constitutional protections from you going in and searching the 702 database that already exists that was collected when targeting foreigners for, for information about them because they were at that protest? The, the reason why FISA exists is to restrict government in areas where they're not restricted, which is searching... Is, which is spying on foreigners located abroad. That's why this law exists. It, it exists so that we can restrict what the intelligence community's activities are. That's why we put it in place as Congress, well before I was here, well before you were here. We put it in place to govern and provide oversight of the intelligence community's collections of foreigners located abroad and to, put, to impose upon it a court review process that was not constitutionally required, and that is the FISA court. Well, it, uh, I believe it enables, instead of just restricting, otherwise they wouldn't be so panicked that it's going to expire. These aren't a list of restrictions. These are list of authorities. It, it is both. It has both the authorization and the restriction. Well, I'll ask you one more time, then I'll go to the other witnesses, um, and then maybe I'll come back to you. So do you believe that somebody who shows up at a protest here in the United States, American citizen, uh, that they have constitutional protections that prevent members of the intelligence community from going into the previously collected 702 database and searching for their name. I believe that under the FISA Act in 702, and, and I think expressly provides uh, provisions, that it is impermissible to go into the foreign information that's collected on foreigners abroad under this act for individuals who are protesting. And I agree with that outcome, which is why Chairman Jordan and myself both agree that it's an abuse, and it was found to be an abuse, for individuals who are protesting George Floyd to have their, uh, their information queried in the 702 database. So it, within that, Mr. Massey, you and I agree. Well, here's what I don't agree. I don't agree that we should do that out of the kindness of our heart or the generosity that we're so benevolent, we're gonna let them have some rights. The, I believe that the Constitution requires, if you go express your First Amendment right, that doesn't put you on a list that then you could go be searched in some database, regardless of how it's collected. I don't care if it's collected with a Ouija board. Well, I, I, with the manner in which you just made that statement, I <coughs> absolutely agree with you. So why not have a warrant requirement 
if, you, if somebody shows up at a protest and a member of the intelligence community wants to search for that person in the 702 database, why not have a warrant requirement? And I'll, I'll let my ranking member answer as you indicated. They're currently, that is an abuse. Under current law, that is a violation. You cannot just do a query based upon the fact that- So when that's happened, did anybody go to jail? That, that is exactly what our reforms are making. But if it's current law, why do you need to reform it? It is current law as it is an impermissible search. Our reforms, based upon what we've seen in abuses, that we all before you said, and I began with, we're here because the intelligence community has abused this process, is to make it both um, more restrictive and so that it would be, there would be real teeth, including criminal prosecutions for people who violate them. So why don't we just use the Constitution instead of coming up with a list that the Intel Committee tells you is a good list of, of things we should, uh, we, ways we should protect people? This program has already been before the, the courts and found to be a constitutional program because it is about collecting foreigners' data abroad. <coughs> Mr. Jordan, Chairman well, I Jordan. Think, I, think, I think you've hit on it, uh, Mr. Massey. We know U.S. person queries are happening. We know that process, Mr. Himes used it several times, that term itself. And so U.S. persons are being searched. We know it was abused 278,000 times. And you're asking the question, what is the standard for conducting that search, for, doing that, for doing that query? And the standard always used to be, if it's an American citizen, probable cause, you got to get a warrant. And now it's something different. And I kind of like to know what that overall number is, how many, Ameri how many U.S. searches are done, and what is the standard for, for doing the search of the U.S. person? I think you've hit it exactly. And that's why we're saying let's go with the standard, the tried and true standard that's been around since this great country, the greatest country ever has been formed. Let's get a warrant. So one of, one of the reasons that I've heard of why we can't have a warrant requirement is it's clumsy. That, uh, and that facilities don't exist for the FISA judges to re review warrants. So the FISA judges, as I understand it, we met one in a skiff, they are federal judges who come uh, to the FISA court, not all the time, they still hear cases back in their districts or circuits, they're federal judges who come and serve as FISA judges, and that uh, one of the arguments that I heard was that they don't have secure facilities in the locations where they're, where they're normally. Is that true, Chairman Turner? Um, I'm having my staff hand me the, the, the paper you, that you've reviewed um, that includes the information, <clears throat> the um, assessment. And you are right. And uh, we, had a, uh, we had for four hours uh, a, the opportunity to have, including a former FISA judge um, in, in classified setting, to describe how this process works and the importance of being able to surveil foreigners located abroad, which again, this program is limited to foreigners located abroad. The information and data is that if there is a, um, if there was a judicial review required to search for Americans that have communicated with Foreign targets abroad, for example, the chairman of the, the head of ISIS, the uh, the head of uh, of Hamas, that it would take um, about two thousand additional judges. You would you would hire, I mean, in the Not case would, of it would require the, the process to search the data that the United States collects on foreigners located abroad, head of Hamas, head of ISIS, Vladimir Putin. Um, it would take. To search that, to, to every time you search that data that was collected lawfully, that it would take an additional 2,000 judges, which is what the question that you had asked. Here's, here's uh, explain this math to me. So you're going to limit it to 500 people to access the database, but you're going to need 2,000 judges to review what 500 people are doing when they're poking in that database for Americans. That is the assessment, and you, you heard from the, um, the FISA court judge, as I did. Um, you and I were in the same briefing. But the numbers don't add up. Why would you need 2,000 new judges to review what 500 people are doing when they're accessing this database? 
Again, you and I received this if you, uh, I, I don't have a I don't have an additional answer to you beyond the well, Mike, that, that you the question I was gonna ask is um, which I did ask was does it require do these judges need skiffs? Do they need secure areas to review these warrants? Uh, not how many judges there would be. I'm, I'm sorry, I was let me let me that. let I me just start where I think we're going to end up. The uh, I've heard as an excuse, other uh, members of our leadership have told me, oh, well, we can't do this. You can't require a warrant to go look in this database on Americans because these judges don't have skiffs where they live. They don't have the secure area to review the warrants. And I find that argument really hard to believe. We just spent $200 million on a new FBI building here. And you're telling me we can't build a, a little closet where the phone conversation can be secure when you call a judge to do a warrant. So I hope we don't hear that argument anymore unless you want to add some weight to it. I, you heard the same thing I did at the same meeting. I, OK. Yeah, sure. Ranking Member Nadler. Um, the fact is, obviously, you can have a skiff in every federal courthouse in the country, and it wouldn't cost very much money. Um, so that is hardly an objection. And what we're talking about with this amendment, with the warrant requirement amendment, is that if you're going to search the phone records of an American citizen because his name uh, or, or his phone call was in someone you were uh, surveilling abroad, and it may be entirely innocent, but to, you have to have some, be able to prove probable cause why you believe that American citizen or that American person is doing something wrong. And that's the purpose of, her, of, 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 of the Fourth Amendment. And that's why we need this warrant requirement that's in this bill, because under the FISA court now, they're surveilling everybody, they're surveilling Americans without probable cause. And that's why we have this amendment. So my next question is, uh, Chairman Turner, is it true there's an exception in this bill for members of Congress? Oh. Right. So there is a section, there are actually several sections that came about as a result of the Donald Trump abuses that relate to political abuses of the process. There are not exceptions. There are notification requirements with respect to Congress, both if there's an individual that is significant to a, um, a political campaign, including a presidential campaign. Some of those are, are, are processes that we're putting in place now. Um, and some relate to the court itself. Because of the concern of what came out of the, the Donald Trump uh, campaign abuses, those notifications would give us the ability to, to ferret out political biases. Was, was your member, was a member of your committee somehow involved in a uh, inappropriate FISA targeting or search? Yes. Uh, and so is that why you created an exception for members of Congress or special yeah. treatment for members of Congress? Yeah. I don't want to call it an exception. Yeah, there is, there is an exception. There's a notification requirement. Um, and um, the uh, Darren LaHood uh, made public uh, that he had been subject to inappropriate query. Uh, he was part of the process for drafting uh, these reforms, and, um, and absolutely, even though he was subject to an inappropriate query, um, is, is adamantly opposed to the application of a warrant to search um, foreigners' data, such as we've been describing. Well, of course, he wouldn't have any objection to it now that he's got an exception. No, there's no exception. Well, now that he gets special notification. Th th there's, there's no exception. Is there a notification? There's a notification to Congress so that we have the ability to oversight. So oversight. wouldn't it, uh, why wouldn't every American get a notification? It, it's not a notification to the individual. It's a notification to Congress for our ability for oversight for political bias arising out of the Donald Trump case. What allowed them, in part, to do the Donald Trump abuses, which again were, were seeking a probable cause warrant, was the fact that they had secrecy and we didn't have the ability to have oversight. 
we want the ability to have oversight when we believe there's political bias. I just, I think the American people would be a little concerned if they knew that there was a notification exception for a member of Congress that didn't apply to regular citizens. It is notification to Congress, not to the individual. Well, why not notify you if uh, um, somebody's running for school board and they're being searched? There, actually, um, Elise Stefanik has been a leader in this. There are, there are provisions that are currently going into effect this year that relate to political candidates also all coming out of the ability to try to prevent the type of abuses that we saw in the Donald Trump campaign because absolutely we saw the, the worst of the intelligence community and I think the worst of the FBI and it is absolutely imperative in these reforms uh, that we make certain that, that we reform them so that can never happen again. And that's what we're doing in the FISA court reform. Well, I'm glad it's, it's happening for presidential candidates. Does the campaign get notified? Uh, we do not have a requirement for the, for the campaign to be notified. We have a requirement for Congress to be able to have the oversight as to what they're doing. So as long as the campaign stays on the good side of Congress, they might be okay. It is bipartisan notification. We, um, and to by, every member of by, Congress, and, well, and by will I be notified? <clears throat> um, it depends on what your role is. I, I, you know, in judiciary, you, you very well could be in a, in a role where you are notified. Will I be? I, I, I don't know. I don't know uh, how uh, judiciary committees would be handling those notifications. Will every member of Congress be notified? No, every member of Congress will not be notified. So it'll be like a few chairmen <laughs> that get to know if a presidential campaign's being spied on? Well, and that's not in this law. That's under current law. Under current law, there are increased notification requirements and limitations as to what they're able to do. Under this law, which absolutely needs to be passed, we have massive reforms that would prevent them to be able to do the, the abuses of Donald Trump in the FISA court. Okay. I started asking about the member of Congress, and you went to Donald Trump. I want to go back to the member of Congress. Who gets notified? First of all, I take, a, I, I take objection with the fact that members of Congress get treated specially in this law over regular citizens. I think we all deserve protection under the Constitution. Um, so I think it, I find it really interesting. We've carved out an exemption for members of Congress, but I'm supposed to be comforted by the fact that just a few chairmen will find out. Is that true? Like, who gets, if a member of Congress is uh, targeted under FISA, who gets notified? I want to be clear, I'm not taken up for members of Congress. I just want to know how this works. What special, what special treatment do members of Congress again, get in this no, FISA bill? There are no special treatments. So let me, let me again go back to this as a notification requirement rising out of the abuses with respect to the Donald Trump campaign so that we can ferret out political bias. Uh, now, the exact provision, because this is, is, is not in the, um, in, in the areas in which, I mean, there, we're in agreement up here on the four of us on the provisions that are currently in this bill. Um, but um, the, the notifications include uh, both Congress and Senate, uh, the Gang of Eight, and um, the uh, uh, legal counsel for the committee indicates that the provision that's currently in the base bill, on which we're all agreement was, does include the queried member getting notice. It, it includes who? It does include the queried member uh, receiving notice. What we need to do, because I, I don't have that in front of me, is we need to pull that provision for you and allow you to read it yourself so okay. you become comfortable with it. I think you described it differently earlier. Yes, my understanding was that they would not have gotten notice. Okay. I'm being told that, that they are. So if a member of Congress, let me get this straight, this is a little carve out for members of Congress. If a member of Congress is targeted, even fairly, legally, they get notified, but an American citizen does not. Is that correct? Well, again, as I told you, uh, the exact provision you're asking questions about, they're pulling it right now, and we'll make sure we give it to you so you have the exact answer. Because I, I obviously did not have the, the accurate information in front of me when you asked the question. Well, let me, let me ask um, some of the other members. If, if, uh, do you know if there's an exception for members of Congress, Chairman Jordan? The notification, uh, yeah, I understand the notification, but 
what's interesting in the in, in the base language is the language is uh, the language uh, would be the gang of eight and that particular member as as uh, Chairman Turner just told you. I don't think I don't think the I don't think the Judiciary Committee gets notified like the Intel Committee would be notified. What is the gang of eight? That's House leadership, Senate leadership, and the and the, and the chairman and the ranking member of the Intelligence Committee. Does the judiciary doesn't get notified? We don't get notified. Why wouldn't you notify the Judiciary Committee if 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 Congress is being spied on? I, I would not have an objection to that. The Judiciary Committee has not asked for that change in the base bill, but I would not have objection. But, my, to that. but let me go back to my original question. When you're able to answer it, is it true that there that if you're a member of Congress and you're being uh, searched in this database, if if some member of the Intel Committee is searching for your identifiers in this database, you get notified. But if you're a citizen, one of the other 350 million people who aren't one of the 535 people that are in the House and the Senate, that you get no such notification. Yes, that's, a, that's accurate. Uh, again, I think underscoring what we've spent the bulk of our time here this afternoon, Mr. Massey, talking about is underscoring why you, you still need this fundamental warrant uh, concept, um, the, or the warrant amendment, excuse me. I think it does underscore the reason that we need an underlying uh, warrant requirement. I mean, I think it is wrong to tell members of Congress, and that'll, that'll help this bill pass, no doubt, like the overall bill, if there's no warrant in it. I, don't th I think it should be thrown in the garbage if there's no warrant in it. Uh, but for those people who might be inclined to agree with me because they're members of Congress and they're worried that they're going to get this backdoor search done on them and their privacy is going to be violated. There's a little wink and a nod. Don't worry, we got you covered on page, you know, 35, line two. That's for you. That's for you, Mr. Member of Congress. If you are going to be targeted in this database, if we're going to search for you or your house or your home address or anything like that or your phone number, we're going to notify you, but we're not going to do that for the rest of America. I think that's wrong. I don't think, I mean, obviously members of Congress are uncomfortable with renewing this authority, especially given that a member of Congress has, has been targeted using this system. Not targeted for information collection, targeted for searches of information that's already been scooped up, terabytes and millions of emails out there. I doubt they were looking for this member of Congress uh, because they thought he was cooperating with the head of Hamas. I mean, I, don't know, I can't know the reason they were in this database fishing around for a member of Congress, and I'm deeply uncomfortable with it because it gets to the balance of power in the government. We're, you know, when we reauthorize this without putting in the constitutional requirements, we are changing the balance of power. But, oh, we got a little, we got a little hook here for us. 535, if you're one of the 535. Let me ask, does this ap apply to the non-voting delegates of, of Guam and Puerto Rico? Can your staff tell me? Because I said 535, maybe there's 541. I, I believe it would apply to all members of Congress. Yes, it would, it would apply to all members of Congress. Well, they're delegates, they're not voting members, but it applies to non-voting members. It, the the intent, again, is an assumption that it is a politically motivated search and to stop political motivations of both, the, which we've clearly found in the FBI and have been incredibly troubling. P politically motivated search. So if, you, if you're a member of Congress, you'll be notified if you're the target of a politically motivated search. Oh, by the way, you can be one of the six non-voting delegates from Guam, Puerto Rico, U.S. Virgin Islands, Washington, D.C., et cetera. But if you're not in that 430, that club of 435 plus 100 plus six extra who get to come along, they don't get to vote, but they get this special protection, have I left anybody out? Presidential candidates get protected. Do they get notified? Again, it's a different, a different provision that, that's, that's not in this bill. I can send you the okay. provisions. Okay, so, so the new thing that's in this bill, the novel concept, is to give every senator and every U.S. rep sort of a special notification if they've been targeted. Is that true? 
To deter political bias. To deter political bias against an incumbent? Does it apply to campaigns? That is a provision that already is law that we have that we have, have put in. I'll, I'll give you a copy of that. At least Stefanik has been a leader in ensuring that, that campaigns also um, are, uh, are reviewed with this higher level of concern, again, coming out of the Donald Trump does, campaign. Does a, does a... It is not this bill. Does a congressman get, uh, a candidate for Congress get notified if they're being targeted? And Let's say they're not an incumbent. Again, the, <clears throat> the, you're using the term targeted, and people aren't targeted. Uh, Use whatever term foreigner, you want, then I'll ask the question again. Unless, unless they're a foreigner located abroad, those are the ones that are, are targeted. Um, but yes, this provision does relate to the issue of the political bias and attempting to eliminate what we saw with the Donald Trump campaign um, of political bias and what we saw, of course, in the in the searches that have related to other members of Congress that appeared to have been politically biased. So a member of Congress gets notified if they're being queried in this database. Does, does somebody who's running for Congress get notified? Not under this provision. Well, isn't that special? Now, if you're an incumbent, you get protection. You get to know when the executive branch has decided to uh, politically target you, because as you said, we're assuming these are politically motivated targetings, if you're a member of Congress. But if you're running for Congress, correct me if I'm wrong, you don't get the same treatment in this bill that members of Congress get. Because I thought I found a loophole there for a second. Everybody should just go register to run for Congress. And it's only 500 bucks in Kentucky, and I got a lot of primary opponents that dis discovered that. But uh, maybe they're maybe they're filing five, spending five hundred dollars and running against me because they think they're going to get protected. But it sounds like the reality is they're not going to get protected. The only people who have this special exemption in here to be notified if they're being queried in this database are sitting members of Congress, sitting senators and sitting U.S. representatives. I think that's a little bit troubling. And I think it was put in there so you could, we could pass this. I mean, who wants to vote to spy on themselves? I don't. But you get to vote. You get to vote on whether this bill becomes law. And, you know, I, as long as you stay in Congress, you're going to be fine. So that's what troubles me about this provision is it's put in there and maybe you get 50 or 100 people who wouldn't have voted for it otherwise are now going to vote for it because they know they've got the pen. They got the congressional pen or the Senate pen. And that's the shield that says, ha, 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 if the FBI or NSA comes after me, I get to know about it. Nobody else does, but I get to know about it because of this bill. Let me, let me ask how this bill, if it has the... Uh, amendments that you would like to see passed on the floor, uh, Chairman Turner, how would it expand FISA? Um, I, I don't believe it expands FISA. Would, um, can you summarize the Intel amendments, what they do? So um, there, are, there are three that, that are of significance. Uh, one uh, relates to counter-narcotics to ensure that um, Counter narcotics is specifically identified as a foreign national security threat. Um, uh, the second uh, relates to uh, vetting of individuals who are seeking entrance to the United States. Again, non US citizens, uh, non permanent residents who are seeking um, uh, to enter the United States. The third relates to a, a FISA court decision uh, on uh, technology. Mm -hmm. uh, technological limitation with respect to FISA. Uh, and the, the FISA court recommended that uh, Congress do a technical correction, and that's the third one. So it, do, it sounds like it does expi expand the use of FISA. If it's going to, like one amendment would expand it in a way that's not being used right now to cover drugs. 
I personally believe that, that narcotics and certainly fentanyl is a national security threat and it should fall under, um, under this bill um, and under FISA and 702. Uh, this clarifies it and makes certain, especially since we are, have such an unbelievable scourge that's coming across the border, uh, that, that there's no question that it's included. Okay, so it is going to expand FISA in some ways. Does it still have that uh, provision about the uh, Wi-Fi providers? There, there is no amendment with respect to. Not amendment, but is in the base text? There's nothing in the base text. Okay. Um, and then well, finally, I want to ask about the uh, expiration. There's a little bit of oddness in the language that some people have noticed that if this bill expires, it reverts to the text, the, the, the existing text of the FISA law. Do you know about this? I, I don't know what you're referring to now. Uh, let me find it here. Um, maybe it's just clumsy wording of the bill, but some people think that there's a revision that uh, when this thing sunsets, it says that the language reverts back to the old FISA. I, I don't know what you're referring to. This, uh, my understanding from uh, legal counsel is that and I don't know the particular provision, so you'll have to, to, to point it out. But my understanding is that the provisions of this underlying bill, which, again, are reforms, uh, is a requirement that the reforms apply immediately, that they're not, that it they'd not be necessary, that, it, that, um, that there be any delay in the reforms going fully into effect. Um. I didn't want to spend too much time on this, but I will. Here's, here's somebody's concerned, and I, I don't know if it's just clumsy wording or. Uh, Chairman Jordan, do you have, want to speak on this? No, I've I've heard about this. I don't know if it's clumsy wording or if it's if it does what some people are, are alleging. Mm -hmm. What I do know is wasn't in the. My understanding is that that language not in the bill that we passed out of our committee. Neither was the language you just spent you know several minutes talking with the chairman on relative to the notification for congressional uh, for members of Congress who have been queried. So, that those. Those elements weren't part of the bill that came out of the uh, Judiciary Committee, as you would know as, as, as a yeah. great member of our committee. Mr. Mass. Yes, Mr. Himes. There has been some confusion because apparently the wording is a little ambiguous, but this entire program, the entire FISA program, including the reforms, expire after five years post-passage. Okay. But there is some language in there that says the reforms expire concurrent I mean, I don't know why it's in there. I think I know why it's in there, and I'll ask you all, but I'm hoping somebody will volunteer why this odd wording is in there that um, on the sunset date, Section 702 will revert back to the way it looked before this bill passes, if it should be pass. Why, why would that be in the bill? Maybe staff can explain it to you. It's um, my understanding is that it's because it's part of the renewal package. It's just one package, um, and and that. But it, our intention and the language is um, that these go into effect immediately, so there be no delay. I, I know we've had a discussion about this, Mr. Massey, when we were in in the meeting that there is a FISA court approval of um, the uh, FISA surveillance uh, package, and we want to ensure that that this is part of the renewal and that they go into effect. Okay, so we can put to bed the rumors that this is to create some permanent uh, authorization of this thing, w of the old version of the bill. But um, what I'm wondering if the, is, was that stuck in there so that five years from now, all of these, we, we start negotiating again without the reforms that you've put in the bill? I mean, I don't... My, my intention would be if, if we 
find that there's violations that we do additional reforms. Uh, I, I think that 702 is going to be a continuous process. I think the package of reforms that we have is a really good one um, because we found real and absolute abuses, and the intelligence community cannot, and the, specifically the FBI, cannot be allowed uh, to continue the ma manner in which they are uh, without these reforms because I, 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 these abuses ignore the intention of Congress. Can you resolve one thing for me? Um, one of your amendments you mentioned is to deal with counter narcotics like fentanyl, but um, you also in the text of the bill you say you're banning searches for evidence of a crime. How would you stop drugs? Like if, if the bill simultaneously says you can't use FISA 702 to stop a crime or search for a crime, why would you roll counter narcotics into this or drugs. Isn't that a crime? Yeah, yeah. Ranking Member Himes. Yeah, Mr. Massey, I described earlier that in order to become a target, um, one of the 250,000 targets, an individual must fall into one of these buckets, and I named counter proliferation, counter terrorism, foreign intelligence officer. This would add an additional bucket. So it would only allow for the putting on of the target list of Mexican cartel members, Golden Triangle operators, that sort of thing. So again, this would be purely an additional bucket in which non-U.S. targets could be added to the target. To I the got target it. List. And that, that makes sense to me. So it would expand the use of the program overseas or outside of our borders to include counter-narcotics in addition to terrorism and money laundry. It would expand the number of targets who would be subject to 702 collection, yes. So um, then we might also expand the use case, though. If somebody in the United States buys a, a marijuana from one of these people and they show up in the database, but we say we're not going to go after them for that. So, um, all right, I will, uh, did, you, did you guys, uh, Chairman Jordan or Ranking Member Nadler, I haven't spent a lot of time asking you questions. Do you have anything to add? No, just, I would just say that just the expansion is just that. It's an expansion. And when you're expanding who you're going to surveil outside the United States, you're inevitably going to pick up a bunch more Americans. And then there's going to be additional U.S. person queries on those, all again, underscoring why it's important to have a warrant. And one of the uh, amendments proposed by the Intel Committee proposes that the 702 uh, uh, apply to anyone crossing our border. That could be immigrate immigrants, legal or illegal, or American citizens. That doesn't make that's any sense true. at all. That, that's not true. You want, you want to and, and that, speak to that, yes, Chairman Turner? Yes, I appreciate it. So back to the illicit drugs. I, I do have now the amendment in front of me, and I want to read the, the category. Uh, it says, specifically, international production, distribution, or financing of illicit synthetic drugs, opioids, cocaine, or other drugs driving overdose deaths or precursors of any aforementioned. And, and I believe that they were, you know, are in the bucket already, but, but when you have an opportunity to reform a bill, especially where we have such unbelievable, and certainly you know, we see it in Ohio of the unbelievable fentanyl deaths, the, the threat that we have coming from China, the threat that we have coming from Mexico, the number of of families across the country that have lost someone uh, to uh, these synthetic drugs and fentanyl. Uh, it, I think it was important to put this in as an amendment so that there would be no question that we'd have an ability to pursue those individuals. Okay, um, just to summarize, I mean, I'm concerned that this reauthorization doesn't include even um, a concession to the Constitution about requiring probable cause and a warrant to go search into this database of information, which is enormous. It's an enormous database. It's never actually been characterized here um, in, in this hearing. Uh, so I'm concerned about that. And we're, it's almost like, well, we feel benevolent because there's some reforms in it, but we're not going to add con the constitutional requirement. We'll just have some reforms. And we're going to trust the same people who've abused this system for, for over a decade that we know of. I have concerns with that. I have concerns that um, anytime I see a bill that has a special provision for Congress, I have real concerns about that. Now, uh, I think it should apply to all Americans, 
If you're going to be the target of one of these, this is a, just just as it just as it was intended to protect political uh, speech or political viewpoints for congressmen, incumbent congressmen, by the way, not challenging congressional candidates, but incumbent congressmen have this protection. I think every American should have this kind of a protection. In fact, every American should be afforded a warrant. And these, these warrants, by the way, that we're asking for in this amendment, they're, I mean, they're still done by a secret judge. It, you know, uh, it's, it's not like it's out in the open. There would be nothing exposed in pursuit of these uh, bad foreign actors to require the warrant. I just think it's, it's constitutional and we need it, uh, Chairman Jordan. A secret judge with exceptions. Right, a secret judge. A secret judge. judge with exceptions. I think the fundamental question is, how many U.S. persons would actually be queried who, who don't fall into that exception? That's the number we need to know. That, the, no one knows what, I mean, maybe, the, maybe the, my, our colleagues know, but we certainly don't. That, to me, is the fundamental question. So I think um, for this bill to be worth passing on the floor of the House, it needs to have the constitutional protection that it lacks, but that it could have if we have this amendment. And so I... I would urge um, making the amendment for the warrant in order so that we can all vote on this. And I yield back to the chairman. Thank you very much. The gentlelady from Pennsylvania is recognized for any questions she may have for the panel. Thank you. I'll try to have a couple targeted questions. Um, chairman Turner, you've mentioned several times that there are amendments that are supposed to address some of the FISA um, violations and abuses that were pointed out by the inspector general. You've mentioned them. Is that correct that these reforms to address the abuses are in the form of amendments, they're not part of the base text? No, that, that's what the base text is. There are okay. 55 okay. Um, uh, amendments to the underlying FISA okay. uh, bill, uh, the, the statute, the underlying FISA okay. statute. Okay. Must um, have gotten distracted by some of the conversation. Um, uh, to our chairman and ranking member from judiciary, um, there's been a representation that judiciary doesn't have a problem with the fact that FISA is supposed to be directed at foreign nationals overseas. You're not proposing that there be a warrant requirement before a FISA search is directed at foreign nationals overseas. Nope. Okay, that may be where that 2,000 judges figure might have come in. But um, it, it is this bootstrapping that, that is so concerning that just because someone has been identified through searches on foreign nationals overseas that suddenly it makes them fair game. Um, as though you move into a neighborhood where maybe there's some criminals and therefore the police can search your house. Um, that's where it seems. I was gonna ask Mr. Jordan to comment first. I agree, if, if again. We have if, to write this down. Yeah, if you're gonna, if, <laughs> well God bless you. Uh, the, uh, if you're going to search a US person you're going to search an American citizen, mm -hmm. their name, phone number, email address. You're going to do that. We think it should require a warrant. Mm -hmm. We think it, mm -hmm. and, and again, we felt like in our committee, and you know you mm -hmm. work great in our committee with, with this whole effort, we even provide exceptions in there, mm -hmm. which, which is, you know, that's a big give, frankly, but we think that is just so fundamental, a separate and equal branch of government overseeing the executive branch before mm -hmm. you're going to go mm -hmm. look at Americans' information. As much as it pains me to say so, I think I agree with you completely you on this there one. Um, it, it is something that has stuck out to me throughout. I mean, we have received briefings from our intel community trying to give us examples of, of why this is needed. And in each instance, it has been, well, it's easier if we don't have to get a warrant, even though we are now directly querying about American citizens, just because they happen to be in this bucket. So, um, is, is, uh, yes, Mr. Nadler. It, it's exactly right. And police work, forget FISA, forget foreign intelligence, police work would probably be easier if you didn't have the Fourth mm -hmm. Amendment to the Constitution. Right, right. So certainly. It's exactly the same situation. Certainly and that's why heard. You want requirement in the bill. That's long been an objection to due process in a variety of contexts, is that it makes it harder to throw people in jail or to violate their civil rights. Um, I am interested in this idea that there could be this expansion to narcotics cases. Absolutely, we need to address the fentanyl scourge. 
But it does appear that this could open up, I think, as Mr. Massey suggested, a whole new bucket of Americans being implicated since the data from all sources show that most fentanyl is trafficked across the border by U.S. citizens. So that is going to bring in a whole another tranche of U.S. citizens for a variety of reasons. So I think you might want to be careful with that one. Um, anything else, Mr. Jordan? Yeah. This is, this is intended to be an effort to reform FISA and, in our case, require a warrant for searches of U.S. persons, not an exercise in any type of expansion. Okay. Okay. I, I don't have anything further. Thank you. Thank you, General Lady. Gentleman from South Carolina is recognized for any questions you may have for the panel. Um, I'll be brief. Um, the notification really is Thank interesting. <laughs> the notification of members of 535 members of Congress is very interesting. Who put that in there? Wasn't it? Actually, the, the bill that you have in, in front of you um, was uh, went through a, um, a working group that was established by the speaker. Um, and so um, this is, they reviewed um, the provisions from both Judiciary and the Intelligence Committee, and it's those provisions that came out of that working group that are in front of you. This, is, this does not represent either our bill or, or their bill. Um, the, um, there were uh, seven members that were on that committee, and they're the ones that made the final decision as to what went in the underlying bill and what did not. And the notification... We're, we're uh, speaking in favor of that bill. That came out of that committee. Okay, but the notification would go to the who had you eight the eight members of had you eight gang of eight. Um, it it's a um, uh, repeatedly in statute when there's a notification to Congress with respect to intelligence issues they they notify the gang of eight and so it was just leverage using uh, current procedures pre or post. I'm sorry. Notification pre-query or post-query? Let me check on that. It's post. So they would have already collected in information and then just told, like, if, if they were going to do a... a pro, there's not an exception. There is no prohibition. You are correct. So they would have had the information to give out uh, and inform us of it afterward. That is, that's very interesting in here. You're, you are correct. There is no exception. Then that that's useless. Once the information is out, it's out. So that's the problem. I mean, and like Thomas said, um, this really with even with the fentanyl, this expands this to really any American. I think, Mr. Natalie, you mentioned that. It's uh, the 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 ones coming across the border now. We don't know who they are. So it opens it up to every American, and the notification, as he said. If it's good enough for Congress, uh, that makes the case for the warrant. I don't understand the, and I tried to, Mr. Turner, you first said, I thought you said that mainly you were talking, you've already, the, it's already protected in law uh, that you don't need a warrant for a foreign, for the head of Hamas. But this is for Americans. Uh, the, the, so so the, the, the point I keep making, and, and I think it would, it is, um, is one that as we have this debate, the members are, are going to um, to be to have to to be given additional information of, of current law, because current law and and, and it, it needs to be absolutely you know understood. Current law requires that if you're going to search Americans' data, if you're going to look into an American's phone or American's email or or their data, um, it requires a warrant. Now. That that is that is absolutely the law. There that, that is constitutional. It is it is fundamental to our basic protections, um, and, um, and and nothing in this bill uh, limits or weakens that. Mr. Norman, it is fundamental to American law, the Fourth Amendment, the Constitution requiring a, a search warrant. However, under Section 702, they have never used search warrants. For querying the Section 702 data about American with respect to American citizens, that's why we have the warrant requirement as an amendment to the right. underlying bill. The underlying bill, frankly, if the warrant amendment is not adopted, uh, I, I think Mr. Jordan and I and 
would not support the underlying bill unless the Warren Amendment is adopted, because it, uh, the underlying bill would, would extend uh, the warrantless searches of American citizens. In the case that Thomas mentioned about Mary Catherine in her emails, uh, who's the guardian when you get into, if she's suspected of, you know, colluding with some foreign agency, they're going to look at everything in that email. And who's the guardian to say you need to decipher just the, I mean, where is that, where's that protection? Mr. Norman, under current law, to look at Mary's information or data beyond emails that, are, that she has sent to someone that's in the 250,000, it's a foreigner located abroad, um, they would have to go to court and have a full probable cause hearing. There is no ability to look at her information, regardless of what she even said, um, to Putin or the head of Hamas or head of ISIS. Uh, there is a requirement under current law for full a warrant a probable cause hearings. Yeah, but that this is only true for new data, but for data that's already in the section correct. 702 database, I, yeah. they can query that without a warrant. Correct. And that's why we need this warrant amendment. Exactly. That, that's, it's, uh, who's going to be the guardian? The, the, that's, that's, this is 2024. What happened to the, the Trump in... I guess in 19 and 20, or even before, how did that come to light? A warrant is really the notification that's needed before anything is done, particularly with Americans. Right, okay, so that actually was a warrant process. What happened to Donald Trump was a court judicial warrant process, and Devin Nunes, who led our committee at the time, uh, was uh, an incredible at ferreting out the abuses that had occurred in the spying on the Donald Trump campaign. And that is why this bill includes reforms and provisions that would stop that from happening in the future. There, there is not an amendment between us that, that uh, amends the provisions of this law that protect, um, the, that change the system to make certain that, that what happened to Donald Trump never happens again. If there was no Dev, Devin Nunes, how would this information get out? Well, it was our, our committee worked in, in concert. Devin Nunes led our committee in, in looking to the underlying because, again, it was the intelligence community. This, as you know, there's a whole movies and books about this. Um, and it, the, um, uh, the intelligence community and the FBI abused the FISA court process uh, and obtained a warrant to, search, uh, to surveil an American, Carter Page, Carter Page. We are making that under this underlying bill uh, so that that does not happen again. And that does not in, uh, relate to the, um, the amendment upon which we disagree. The underlying bill has provisions of which there's no amendment to strengthen um, that uh, changes that system uh, so that protections are, will be in place. And, and Chairman Jordan's nodding his head. Yeah, there's two parts to FISA. There's, there's the, the FISA court where you can go and get a warrant to spy on whoever you want to spy on, for American, any American you want to do. And that, was, that process was abused relative to the 2016 presidential election. They spied on President Trump's campaign. And then there's a 702 program. To the Mary Catherine example, though, and the ranking member is right, this, this database is big. It, I call, that's why I call it the haystack. It's a haystack of information, but you're going to take Mary Catherine's name or phone number or email, and that's the U.S. person search in that database. You're not searching whoever the foreigner she was talking to. The search is not on that individual. The search is on her. And so, when the search is on her, on an American, again, get a warrant. Get a warrant. Um, let me ask you one other question. On the, I know the 10,000 people that had access to the database has been, has been uh, trimmed back to 500. What penalties are there once the 500 get access to the uh, database when they give that information out? Um, what protection is there that? There are now criminal uh, penalties and prosecutions if the information is leaked. From the 500? So yes, absolutely. The, those, are, those are reforms that are now in this bill that is before you. Well, the only thing I would say, the, the notification issue being carved out for us uh, it, it ought to be for every American. It's, 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 that's not that big of a deal. And like... Uh, Mr. Nadler mentioned the skiff can be set up in any courtroom. That's not reinvent the wheel. That's not that ex expensive. Um, but anyway, it's been an interesting discussion and more interesting discussion to follow. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. I now recognize uh, Mr. Roy from Texas for his questions. 
I thank my friend from Kentucky. Um, I, a couple of questions here about process. I mean, we're obviously in the Rules Committee. Um, we've had debates and discussions about process. There's been some bipartisan agreement, some bipartisan disagreement um, in terms of what gets to the floor and how it gets to the floor. Um, I've got strong concerns about the legislation that gets to the floor of the House under both parties. Um, but that's a larger question for another day. But I, I wanted to make sure I have a clean understanding of the process that has led to this moment where we currently sit, uh, sitting here on whatever today is, April 10th, um, uh, 2024, wherein we have, I think, a period of time here before uh, FISA expires, having been extended in December for a temporary time, which, of course, triggered an automatic extension effectively or, you know, allowed the courts to extend till next spring, till 2025. Um, but so now we've got this important issue. And as I recall, and I wondered if the uh, chairman can clarify for me that, that both committees, Judiciary and Intel, reported out legislation in December, early December, uh, each of their respective bills. Um, and, 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 I'm obviously a member of the Judiciary Committee, uh, and I wonder if I'd ask the, uh, both the chairman and the ranking member. The Judiciary Committee reported out a bill that I believe was, was it 34 to 2? 35 to 2. 35 to 2? Don't sell us short. I, I know, to try not to. Uh, it is one of those rare moments of agreement, uh, Mr. Ranking Member. But uh, so 35 to 2. Uh, if the legislation that is before us today were brought before the House Judiciary Committee, uh, would the, uh, for I'll ask the chairman, it was unanimous on the Republican side. Would it be unanimous in the Republican side if it's reported out as it is unamended in the Judiciary Committee? Oh, no, no, no. Well, well, I, don't, I don't know if it had even been brought up. Wouldn't have been brought up by the chairman. I understand. Uh, but if it were put to a vote in the Judiciary Committee as it is, it would, it would fail overwhelmingly, right? Overwhelmingly. Would the ranking member concur? I would. Yeah. Um, and uh, if I remember correctly, the bill uh, initially, there was discussions in December to put the bill, well, let me back up. Does the Judiciary Committee have the primary jurisdiction over this topic? Did it when it was originally passed? Does it yes. today? Yes. yes. So we have the Judiciary Committee with the primary jurisdiction passed 35 to 2 on a bipartisan basis. We passed legislation, and as I understand it, it was uh, at that point in time supposed to be brought to the floor and then allow amendments, right, in a relatively open process, something we've all been trying to restore uh, but utterly failing to, to uh, be able to carry across the goal line fully. So that is, as I understood, the initial process. Then there was some wailing and gnashing of teeth. Uh, then there was a working group that met, and about uh, some period of time through that, as I understand it, there was disagreements between the Intel Committee and Judiciary Committee. Is that a fair characterization of what occurred? That's fair. Is that would the would the chairman and ranking member of the Intel committees do they agree that there was a working group that was put together and that there was then a disagreement or a number of disagreements between judiciary and Intel that then led us to an impasse in December? Is that a fair characterization? The speaker formulated his own working group uh, after he replaced Kevin McCarthy. Yeah. And so then, so then there was, a, I believe, uh, a, a kind of pause, if you will. There was some discussion of Queen of the Hill. Let's put both bills on the floor. There was a bunch of back and forth. So now we got through that kind of second debate. There was then a third iteration of a working group, which I believe then had a different group of members, which had some members of the judiciary and, and intel, but also had some leadership members, uh, some other committee members, non-judiciary intel. Uh, and that that debate then occurred. And that then from that, there was base text created, with a promise of amendment votes on virtually everything that we couldn't come to agreement on. Isn't that roughly what was being discussed? I think that might have been January-ish. Is that rough character? Okay. Then the, uh, and, and I saw the chairman of judiciary ranking his head yes, just for, for the record. So then, then I believe that kind of got side railed. Uh, and then we're, we're told each, uh, then we had a version that said, well, each side will get three amendments and there'll be a standalone vote on a fourth vote on amendment uh, on the uh, fourth amendment not for sale mr warren davidson's amendment i believe that was then a discussion point and i believe that was what then came to this committee about a month and change ago right that we came to this committee with the base text that came out of that process 
And they'd have three amendments on each side, but then there was going to be potential vote on this Fourth Amendment not for sale. Is that also a fair characterization? Yes. I believe that the judiciary chairman is, is ranking his head yes. So now, that, then we're told, another iteration, that the Fourth Amendment not for sale is off the table. And now what we're being told is, is that there might be a separate vote on the Fourth Amendment not for sale, but it'll be a uh, vote on, you know, under suspension of the rules, which almost certainly guarantees its failure. So I say that as the backdrop because this is the Rules Committee. We're supposed to be the safeguards of the process. We're supposed to be the safeguards of how law is, you know, made and brought forward. And a whole big debate about whether legislation gets sort of created behind closed doors and then dropped down with a sort of take it or leave it approach. And rather than putting this bill on the floor and just offering a bunch of amendments and letting the cards fall where they may, where they may for example, Mr. Davidson's amendment, which has now been ruled uh, unable to be considered, um, and other amendments that I think others would occur. For example, I'd love to have an amendment that would say, why don't we just have a one-year reauthorization, two-year reauthorization, three-year reauthorization. Now, why might I want to do that? Well, because we've got a lot of divisions here. There's been a lot of debate. Uh, everybody here recognizes that there's important uh, issues at play with 702. We want to maintain some of those powers, be able to go after bad actors directed towards foreign actors. And, uh, but we also want to protect American citizens. So why can't we just have an amendment that says, let's do a two-year reauthorization so that maybe we can you know, see how these reforms work. And if they're not working so well, not have to wait for five years to see if there's another 230,000 Americans or whatever the number is that get, uh, get spied upon. That's the backdrop. I would just ask the, the ranking member of the Committee, because I believe before I got here, and forgive me, my plane was delayed after the uh, eclipse population in Texas filled the airports up <laughs> rather full. Um, it was pretty cool, though. Uh, the, um, uh, the ranking member, because you did talk about process, I was getting some updates while I was in the air, that um, would you concur with roughly what I just laid out and that that's concerning from a process perspective? Yes. And does that, match yes. some of this, does that match some of the things you were raising before I got here? It does. So, so having said that, one of the issues that I, I want to uh, explore that I don't think was explored by my friend from Kentucky, and I do want to say that I associate myself with, I think, all of the remarks uh, of, the, of the gentleman from Kentucky, but they were, they were a long set of remarks, so, so it's a little bit of risk in doing that. But I believe that I associate myself with every, of every bit of his concerns that he laid out and the questions that he was asking. But, but there was another, there's another uh, issue that I think merits um, a concern, which is, when I look at the language of the text of the Narcotics Amendment, the, the Narcotics Amendment, and, and look, as I say, this is a Texan who had six children die in the school district in which my family lives from narcotics, I mean, from fentanyl uh, poisonings. Uh, it is a terrible scour scourge to use the word, I believe, the chairman of Intel used a moment ago. We share that belief. Uh, I certainly want to use the, the full force of the government uh, as possible to go after the foreign actors and the cartels in Mexico, whatever we can do to stop their assault on this country. That being said, um, the way this is drafted raises concerns. Um, and I say that as a federal prosecutor who would associate himself with remarks, I believe it was the ranking member, but I think uh, others, about, of course we want every bit of information we can get if you want to go prosecute bad guys. Of course. Right? I mean, if you're, if you're in the U.S. Attorney's Office, you want to get every bit of information you can possibly get so that you can go after people with whatever that might be. I remember I had a, a I think I mentioned this in committee before, but Merritt's mentioning again. In one case, I had a phone uh, from a bad guy that, uh, that I was able to uh, uh, put behind bars uh, for being a felon in possession. But he had a phone filled with all sorts of incriminating stuff that we wanted to go pursue. And the cop grabbed the phone when they... Uh, I was a Terry Stop or whatever, when they searched the guy and uh, grabbed the phone and unfortunately downloaded the stuff off the phone before he got a warrant for the phone. And that was a problem. And I was unfortunately unable to use said information off of the phone to go after said bad guy. And there was a lot of good stuff on there. Um, and, uh, but that's a good thing. That's a good thing. And you need the brakes put on both prosecutors, law enforcement broadly, foreign intelligence collectors, to make sure that they're not abusing it. Now, my question on the Narcotics Amendment, right? I, well, the way I read the, the text of the amendment, there's nothing specific related to illegal 
drugs internationally that wouldn't be swept in generally. I mean, it, the language that says, you, 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 you know, it says production. Well, you know, does that, uh, does that count Sudafed? Uh, you know, if, if we have got lots of Americans who, by the way, who go to Mexico and buy drugs for a variety of reasons, we could start debating drug policy and so forth here. But so you go overseas and you buy Sudafed. Well, we all get that. Like, what's, what's the deal here? It's like, what, what are precursors in this context? You know, what, what, what is a, you know, what, what about, uh, you know, uh, the ingredients like in cold medicine that can be used in meth and so forth? We all know that's how it's done. So can an American be swept up under this? I'd ask the chairman if, if, if you believe that that could be possible here. I'm opposed to the amendment. I'm, I'm, and my, for me, it's more just fundamental grounds. I don't think we're, this, this is a bill to be expanding by, as I think uh, Congressman Massey established mm -hmm. that fact, as you pointed out in his good questioning a little while ago. Um, so I, I'm opposed to the amendment. There could, be, there could be problems with how it's drafted. I haven't looked at the, the specific language as close as maybe you have, uh, Congressman Roy. I'm just opposed to expanding FISA, and I know this does that. I wonder if, if the chairman of, of Intel could uh, illuminate uh, us on whether we believe people could get swept into that uh, under that kind of loose definition of production. Right, so the, the language specifically is international production, distribution, or financing of illicit synthetic drugs, opioids, cocaine, or other drugs driving overdose deaths or precursors of any of the aforementioned. So it has qualifiers, one, of it requires that they're illicit, illegal. Um, Sudafed's not illegal. Um, that they be specifically in the category of synthetic opioids, cocaine, or other drugs, and it specifically uses the language driving overdose deaths, the, 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 the cost that families in our country have paid for the, the illegal fentanyl uh, trade that's happening in the United States is just heartbreaking. Um, this provision, uh, as all of FISA in 702, which we've all agreed is, is, is the case, uh, relies, relates only to foreigners located abroad. Uh, it is not uh, Americans, it's not people located uh, legally in the United States, it's foreigners located abroad who are involved in international production, distribution, or financing of illicit, again, illegal, synthetic drugs, opioids, cocaine, or drugs driving overdose threats. Well, it, what, it, it still leaves me wondering when we talk about precursors, and it still leaves me uh, wondering when we're talking about the production of illicit drugs. Well, I mean, meth kills lots of people. And, I mean, I, I can't even go in America and go buy certain drugs without showing ID and, and going through certain hurdles because of uh, the concern how those products are being used to create and develop illicit drugs. So my concern here, right, is because we're talking about the expansion of the power uh, of, of government with respect to surveillance and for law enforcement, that this seems like this is a very loose tool. And again, as someone who very much wants to stop the, the drug trade and very much wants to uh, uh, you know, eliminate the, the uh, death and devastation from fentanyl and all these uh, synthetic drugs. Um, nevertheless, my primary concern here is the expansion, which I believe it's most certainly clearly is, an expansion of the use of 702. Um, and, and I'm, and I'm uh, I, I, it also begs the question of, because um, it came up a minute ago about, uh, Mr. Massey asked about the Wi-Fi issue and I do believe, right, I mean, there is an amendment, right, that, that addresses that issue and, and that it raises certain concerns in terms of its breadth and in terms of what it might sweep in. Um, and in fact, if I remember right, in the amendment, the, um, the definition has specific exclusions for senior centers, hotels, um, coffee shops, those kinds of things, right? But it would beg the question that those specific exclusions sort of raises the concern about then, well, who are you including? So if you need the exclusions, uh, doesn't that raise the specter of a fairly broad piece of language uh, for which it needed to have specific exclusions identified? And I, I just wondered if the, if the Intel chairman might be able to respond uh, to that question. Right, so again, 702 applies to foreigners located abroad. Um, so it doesn't relate to your local Starbucks. It doesn't relate to your local hotel. It doesn't relate to your local Wi-Fi system. 
Uh, there are individuals who have raised concerns uh, to both Sherry and to the Intelligence Committee uh, about um, provisions that relate to um, uh, technological issues of FISA collection. This, this language responds to those concerns. But once again, you, you can't be at your local McDonald's and be a foreigner located abroad. I mean, the bill only relates to collecting on foreigners located abroad. So you can't be at McDonald's in Dayton, Ohio, or in Texas, because you've come and watched the eclipse, uh, and be a foreigner located abroad. Um, and, but we just wanted to make sure that people had these specific items that people have raised um, specifically eliminated. But as, as you'll recall, when you start with the category of it's only foreigners located abroad, it, it by definition cannot be these things. But we wanted to expressly uh, state these things so people uh, would not have concerns. So I, I just wonder if, if either the chairman or ranking member of judiciary would have anything to add to that, because as I remember correctly, I mean, it, it, I, mean I, I, I hear what the um, Intel chairman is saying, um, but, but again, all of this is interconnected. It's the whole point. It, it's, it's, it's how the tools are being used. I mean, so you, you know, identify a subject you want to go after, but you're then collecting information in order to go after said subject. Um, and, and by the way, the definition still allows you not to be targeting one individual, but be, you know, targeting anybody uh, kind of related to it uh, under some broader uh, kind of scope. And here, you know, we went through this before, and I don't remember all this, but, uh, you know, we, we rejected previous regimes, the whatever it was, the Protect America Act and other mechanisms that we specifically rejected um, because we didn't want it to be too broad, but yet this is now putting a toe back in that water to create not even just a toe, like a whole foot is jumping in back into that water. I wonder if the Judiciary Committee uh, Chairman and or Ranking Member would have anything to add to that. Well, there are a number of uh, amendments uh, to the underlying bill which would expand uh, uh, FISA greatly, which would expand uh, um, the, the surveillance of Americans greatly. And you've mentioned some of them, the, uh, the, the def expanding the definition of electronic communication services. Um, the one that uh, would, would, would apply to anybody crossing our borders. Um, I'll leave it at that. Mr. Jordan, anything to add? I, I would just, again, I'm, I'm opposed to expanding it. I, I view the three amendments offered by our, our, our friends and colleagues from the Intel Committee as being expansions of FISA. Um, the most important thing is where we spent the bulk of our time today, requiring a warrant to search U.S. persons. Plain and simple. That is the most important thing. Without that in the bill, I think the ranking member, if I've said this a number of times, without that in the legislation, we're not going to support it. Exactly right. Um, and to clarify on that point with respect to a warrant requirement in terms of what we would like to see added and what we put in the Judiciary Committee product, it would do nothing to truly restrict the government's ability to use Section 702 to target foreigners outside the United States, correct? Correct. It simply reiterates the existing Fourth Amendment protection, um, but makes clear that it will, in fact, be followed by requiring uh, it to be uh, followed. Is that correct? Correct. Yes, because it's not being followed now when a U.S. Right. person is, their data is searched in this, what I, again, call the haystack of information. Um, I, I would ask one other, you know, I, I, there's an amendment that uh, is something that I offered in the Judiciary Committee and that I think is um, important, and and I would ask uh, the Judiciary C uh, Committee Chairman Ranking Member, then I'll and I'll ask the Intel guys that um, you know the bill includes the notification to Congress and members of Congress. Info is searched as as Mr. Massey outlined, and I offer an amendment that would require um, that Congress be notified on a quarterly basis rather than annual. And, and the the re rationale from my perspective even though I would have preferred monthly, but uh, I got, I got uh, uh, asked to make it quarterly uh, in the committee. But, uh, but, but we move, moved it to quarterly because I believe Congress will be able to better follow what's happening in real time to, to the American people and be able to know in a more active basis. So uh, I, that's, that's, that's the purpose. And then there's another piece to the amendment, which I think is important, which is to require that the Judiciary Committee uh, chairman and ranking member, be able to go to the FISC proceeding and be able to go there and observe what is in fact occurring 
And so I would, I would uh, ask the Judiciary Committee Chairman, Ranking Member, if you believe that amendment is a step in the right direction um, and something that would merit uh, importance uh, in addition to, obviously, our desire that there be a warrant protecting the American citizens, that we'd have a member of Congress be able to locate and go to the FISC, observe, and get more detailed and more uh, and reports on a, on a more regular basis. I, I certainly agree. And the chairman's nodding in the affirmative as well, uh, Chairman Jordan. Uh, and I wonder if you'd be surprised that, that we were reached out to by the Department of Justice in my office to uh, back off of the requirement that the Judiciary Committee chairman and ranking member be uh, uh, allowed to sit in the proceeding. And we were, we were told to do that because, or asked to do that because it might be constitutionally problematic, separation of powers. So uh, I just want to be clear that what I was being uh, asked to do under the guise of separation of powers was to say that a Fisk court, which of course has Article Three ramifications, the executive branch, Article II, uh, all under laws formed by Article I, that we would say that it would be constitutionally problematic for us to take the chairman and the ranking member of the elected uh, members of Congress who are sitting in the chair and ranking member of the Judiciary Committee, the House Judiciary Committee, with primary jurisdiction, jurisdiction over this subject, with primary jurisdiction over the Department of Justice and the FBI, that it would somehow be constitutionally problematic from a separation of powers perspective to have them there. Would the chairman and ranking member like to comment on that? I agree. You agree with me that that's... Ridiculous. Yeah, I don't, I, I, again, I don't think the amendment calls for any type of uh, any type of uh, activity that would be involved. We're not. We're not going to. Uh, we're just observing. We're just right. there watching. Just like uh, just like I went to a Supreme Court argument a couple of weeks ago and watched right. that Supreme Court argument. So, uh, as long as it's only that, I don't see. I don't see a constitutional concern. If there's some kind of task or or procedure that we're supposed to be involved in, I think that would be, and we wouldn't. We wouldn't. Would raise that. a question. There's a. There's at least a question about that. And so, uh, to that end, uh, and I would I would add is that uh, uh, it was raised as um, as the question was raised is like, well, why why would you be there? That was the question, and the the answer was because someone needs to protect the American citizen, because someone needs to be sitting there looking and saying, hey, American citizen, one of the two hundred and something thousand odd who had their privacy violated, or the as Mr. Massey noted, three hundred and 30 million Americans who don't have an election certificate sitting in Congress who are getting the protections that this bill would offer, that maybe one of those or two of those members of those 535 be able to sit in there. And, and by the way, it was it was beyond just those two, right? I believe the amendment uh, includes intel, includes uh, leadership on both sides, a bipartisan basis. And so uh, I, I, would, I, would, I would observe that. I know we've got votes being called and we'll have time to debate this on the floor. I've been trying to give it the full full uh, force that it deserves, given that Mr. Massey bought me some time when I was flying back from Eclipse Mania. But I, look, I, I would just uh, want to end with, with this point, which is I don't believe this is the right way to, to, to do this. I don't believe this is the right way to conduct business. I don't believe that this legislation is going to uh, represent, um, I think, the best bipartisan protection of the American people uh, that we could produce. And I believe we can and should do better. Uh, and I believe that we should have the ability to offer amendments that are not being offered right now. Um, but we're trying to weigh all this and figure out the best way to proceed given the expiration. Again, I would prefer to be able to offer an amendment to shorten the term of the reauthorization. And we'll continue to have some debates here uh, the rest of the day. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. I now recognize Ms. Ledger Fernandez for her questions. Uh, thank you very much, and uh, my apologies for having missed uh, the opening. I was uh, handling the uh, House Natural Resources, uh, and it was all bipartisan down there. Uh, there were a lot of good bills that we were all supportive of, and it made me remember that uh, Valentine's Day when we had the chair and the <laughs> ranking member in, and it was like a love fest here. So I am sorry that I missed the Intelligence Committee, because it sounds like you two would have also been in agreement on many of the elements in uh, this version of the bill, uh, which brings the issue that I think bipartisan is very important that we get there, but that 
we also need to come to an agreement uh, that uh, meets the, the, the many areas in that we know we'll be able to get something passed since this is uh, ticking and that there appear to be issues that aren't resolved. And whether or not we're going to be actually having a rule or having a vote and what we're doing here. So I will wait to see what happens. And given the shortness of time, I uh, once again, uh, my apologies for not being here for uh, your uh, presentations, which I, I'm sure was equally as uh, bipartisan as the judiciary was. I call it the alternate universe uh, in the Rules Committee. Uh, so I'm sorry I missed that. And with that, I yield back. Thank you. Generally yields back. I now recognize Mr. Burgess for his questions. Yeah, I won't, uh, I won't go into questions, but I do feel obligated to point out that it was 22 years ago tonight that I actually won a runoff election for the Republican nomination for the 26th District of the State of Texas that I was not supposed to win. But just like Mr. Turner and Mr. Cole, we came in in that class, and it was our highest priority coming on the the heels of the disaster at 9-11, that that never happened again. So while there's obviously not complete agreement here, this is an important topic, and uh, I'm glad to see we're giving it the, uh, the attention it deserves. And I'll yield back to Mr. Massey. Thank you, Dr. Burgess. Thank you for appearing before us today. Witnesses are now excused. Thank you, Chairman. Oh, right. Kind of vote. Well done. Yeah. Hey, I'm going to have to... Uh... Thank you.